Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Brian Beyer, coming on for the second time. Brian is the CEO of Hellbender, Inc., and a veteran in the U.S. Marine Corps. Also, has touched quite a few really interesting robotics projects and is still incredibly active in the robotics community internationally. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm excited to be here, Spencer, and thanks for having me on before. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I, I got to thank you for that. I mean, you introduced me to Gal Limbar, who has since brought on like three or four Israeli guests, so I appreciate that. Um, Louisa Michaels, also a great human. Uh, thank you for opening some doors. Oh, no problem. And Gal's going to be on soon. Yeah, next yep. week, maybe. He's coming on very shortly here, so he might be the next one. There might be one in between. I can't remember the schedule off the top of my head. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. No, he's a, he's a great guy. And um, the 412 by 972 initiative is uh, something we're really excited to be a part of. That's awesome. Can I ask what kind of stuff you're working on? Or? Yeah, at Hellbender. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, um, uh, so we've, uh, we've grown a little bit. Um, we started almost a year ago. So by the time I think the podcast airs, we'll be in September. Yeah. But the, uh, um, Adela Wee joined me um september 1st last year that's cool so she's um a fellow roboticist systems engineer uh she came out of olin college oh sweet i wanted to go there but i wasn't good oh enough. the <laughs> the uh, the gem of like the integrated hardware software community like sweet. If, if it's a. Uh, um, Megaboss guys came out of there, I think. Uh, so many people in the Pittsburgh area actually yeah. come out of there. Um, nice. Lots of lots and lots of talent. Um, the, My uh, high school just didn't offer enough guys. APs from the get in. But who? Uh, Skydio. Nice. Like, um, Wait, what's lot, Skydio doing? I'm an idiot. Um, oh, they're they're one of the premier um, U.S. UAV companies. Oh, sweet. Like awesome. uh, commercial and government drones. Slick. Um, love for Hellbent to do something with them. We're not right now, but yeah. if you're listening, like uh, Skydio. <laughs> Um, the, uh, no, Olin College is great. I mean, they started out with this, we're already off on a tangent, which is, uh, which is great. Like, that's what I, <laughs> what I love about conversations with you, Spencer. The, um. Enjoy talking to you too, Brian. So, Olin, um, uh, founded by. Franklin um, W. Olin's endowment. That, that's right. And after his death. After his like death. quite a while. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, when you think about, like, key faculty members, you know, you have founding members of iRobot. Um, you have just folks that wanted to teach robotics in a very different way, in a project-based way, which is something I think you and I resonate with. Of like course. When you think about like how we how we execute, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's neat that they decided that they were going to be strictly fifty-fifty male and female admission. Because, oh, I didn't know they did that. Oh yeah, I mean when when we think about like um, DEI and they've got to be the only engineering school that's doing that. I mean it's very male heavy. I, unfortunately, I hope. I hope that's not true, but as far as I know, it's when true. When I was at Case, it was 67% male or like something. I'm getting the number wrong, but like close is, makes no difference to like two-thirds male. It, it, the um, Olin College, I think, is is absolutely somewhere that I aspire uh, for my daughter to look at. I nice. Hope that, like more, you know, more colleges, you know, start to, to start to take that on. Because at the end of the day, if, if you want to change the uh, gender diversity in an in industry, it has to start education. Correct. And it's not yet. Yeah. Right. And we're doing a lot well, here locally. And I yeah. love that the 50% because I've seen like all women, I've, I've mentored the girls still for a while. Yeah. And so like, I mean, I, and I like what they're doing, but I like the idea of just like, I mean, you're going to interact with dudes in the workplace. Why not start in school? 50% each. I mean, that seems pretty reasonable. That's right. And yeah. if you want your workforce to reflect that way, like if you're a business owner or you're a project leader, or whatever else, then you have to make sure that your interns reflect that as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that that we did at Carnegie Robotics before um, um, uh, before I left um, that that I was really excited about was um, uh, one of our one of our staff. I think it was Juneteenth. If I get this wrong, I'm sorry, but it's a better story this way. <laughs> the, um, uh, I think it, I think we were getting close to Juneteenth. We were we were asking people in the company. Um, that, that were black, like what we could do and things like that. And Anaya Ellerby Johnson, who's still at Carnegie Robotics, um, love you, Anaya, incredible, like basketball player at Pitt. Sweet. Um, the, uh, um, you know, she basically said to leadership at CRL, put up or shut up. Like, you're not doing enough. Like, you don't, you don't get to celebrate this day unless you're putting out. And what are you the, putting out? 
in terms of like uh, just a challenge to leadership at Carnegie Robotics, which at the time I think was 130 or 140 people, um, to do more to hire and elevate um, African Americans and um, um, the uh, biracial people of color into like engineering jobs like yeah. at, at CRL. And, you know, we frankly we were doing enough. Like we had um, the, uh, uh, we had a handful of black employees um, or biracial employees. And the, um, I call everybody out by name, but I want to be really respectful. Um, <laughs> but sense. the, uh, other than Anaya who called it out. So I love talking uh, talking oh, about yeah, like what she did. That fits in the story pretty nice, though. I think. So said the white dude. Said the white dude. So <laughs> exactly said said the uh, um, said the elevated white male who has no genetic diversity outside of the British Isles. And <laughs> the uh, so what what we ended up doing was was created this um, um, black black engineering scholarship program. Oh, cool. Um, we we offered um, internships to. Um, I think that opening year we did um, six interns that were high school students in Allegheny County Interesting. or the greater Pittsburgh area. I'd be curious to know how you did with the high school internship program, like regardless of race, but we can get into that in a sec. Sorry. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that's 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 a, that's a whole that's that's an element of it for sure. Yeah. Um, we got, you know, for the opening for the opening salvo, we reached out uh, Kevin Papa, actually, who we were just talking yeah, about. Yeah, good dinner. dude. Um, great, great great guy like uh, elite uh recruiter um uh kevin paper actually reached out to every single secondary education school in the greater pittsburgh area and was like we have this program who do you know who should apply best and the brightest uh best and the brightest and we uh and we went and we went or hardest working um nice and we uh and yeah we that went, fits and we went through it and we picked out like a number of students and, and brought them in and the, uh, um, and then the, um, and then one of those at the end of the summer was going to get awarded like a $5,000 a year scholarship to, you know, to college. 500,000 a year? A 5,000. Oh, 5,000. 5, okay, got it. Um, I say what kind of college coach is 500 grand, but I was wrong. Sorry. Maybe CMU raises its rates. You know, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, to be honest. Yeah, uh, you know, foreign students will pay anything. Um, yeah. They're not that far off. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. It feels that way. Cut that, cut that. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll leave it in. It's all good. Um, they're amazing. And so yeah. the, uh, um, and yeah, and then a bunch of us got to, you know, mentor individual students. So the, uh, uh, my mentee was uh, a young lady named Amira Johnson, who oh. you guys can see her on, on, on my LinkedIn incredible you should offer her a job um she was by far the most aggressively entrepreneurial sweet. like in in high school um was a member of uh, girls of steel sweet um and what if um, I, I wonder if her and i you might you might have you might have crossed over and uh, she's the same individual there's a few that i there's like one i've kept in touch with as she's become like an engineer and we still talk today but. that's cool for the most part, I haven't kept in touch with many of our alumni, if I'm being honest. I mean, what you really want to do is you just want to, you know... She had like a moment where she needed support, and I I, I don't want to say who, because I don't want to single anyone out, but, you know, we, we talked that's great. and worked through a professional situation she that, was going through. And that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, at the end of the day, like the, you know, what, what we aspire to as uh, as mentors is just to be resources and to yeah. be available. Well, it was bad. She was getting sexually harassed by her boss at, boss at one of the local robotics companies. Like, oh, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, it's fucked up. Like, I, 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 it's weird getting into this, but I'll say it anyway because you know it seems like we're going that way. Like, I've brought three female sales rep to sales reps to like trade shows, and all three of them have been like sexually harassed, like at the trade show. Like, it's really bad. Like, I don't know. It's and I, I don't know if that's a this that's one. A part I think it was a program culture. manager that like went after like my mm. student. You know, and I, it was it was it was not a pretty not a good look for the industry. No, that's not good. I mean, we need to do better, right? So yeah, I agree. the, uh, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like what what we want to achieve is that we can get to somewhere that we're proud of. Like, you know, later on, we're we're excited about, um, and we're doing stuff. I mean, you know, there's it doesn't mean that like the bad out. You know, there's not there's been a lot of good too. Mm -hmm. I mean, to get hung up on that, but sorry. Yeah, 
No, but I'm, uh, that was um, it. Just as a, in a, as an example on the uh, um, on the diversity side of the house, like I thought, I thought that was actually um, a pretty cool response. Um, I think I think CRL is keeping that up. It's a That's super awesome. great program. Yeah, I'm glad they're doing that. Yeah. Well, yeah. it sounds like there's some brilliant folks that have just come up through it. I mean, hands off to Kevin for being able to recruit talented co- high school kids. Um, I mean, the high school kids at large is is certainly a challenge. Like, uh, yeah. you know, we're in the Commonwealth, so the uh, so there's rules that you have to follow with regard to you know work hours and availability and makes sense. You know, things like that. My first job was I was 14 years old. It was at Cornell University. I was stringing Cat Five uh, for the chemistry department, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and I'm grateful. I wanted to start earlier, but they wouldn't let me. It wasn't legal. It's, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was doing that. There was another kid that was 15 years old who I really looked up to. He had his, like, Red Hat certified technician, you know, at 15 years old. Nice. Yeah, he was, he was super brilliant. I think his granddad was, like, a Nobel Prize winning chemist. And I <laughs> uh, haven't talked to him in a while, uh, but I looked up to you, man, if you're listening. Uh, his name was Joe McLafferty. Me. And, yeah, I think he ended up, like, as, like, a building contractor, like, working on houses or something. Like, he went the other direction with it. He went left. He was yeah, like, exactly. I had enough of the, yeah. But at the time, like, there was, like, this freebie pile that would give away, like, glass where the labs were done with. And he was like, oh, I can use this for my double displacement reactions. <laughs> like, like, dude, you're 15. Yeah. But um, SpaceX had a high school internship program that was kind of interesting while I was there. It was a mixed bag in terms of talent. Like, I mean, there were some brilliant kids, but they were still inexperienced. I was, an exp- I was not a good worker at 14. I'm sorry to my boss, Shirley. I, I may have let you down a few times, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I'd be, what was it like at, in Carnegie? Like, did you ever have just like growing pains with it being people's first job and then just figuring out how to integrate into the workforce? Well, for Cause, sure. Yeah. I mean, you had uh, I, the the full gambit, right? Like when when you're dealing, I think when when you're dealing with young adults, um, all the behaviors tend to get amplified. Yeah, right? makes sense. Um, so there's. Uh, um, they don't know about ghosting and no shows and, you know, like call aheads and, you know, give some warning about availability and, yeah. and things like that. Um, all of the transportation issues, you know, like bu- bulb of the surface, no, right? They don't drive. They don't drive, you know? Um, so I, I think a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to like, what's the expectation of work that was set by the, uh, you know, but by the household, like what examples have they had? Yeah. When I've experienced that hiring college students, even where like, you know, I've had to give people a ride to work. Right. To jump on an SKA project like a few times. Or they vanish uh, for a long coffee break and you're just yeah. like, all right, listen. It's okay to do that. So long as you give ample notice and make sure you're not being relied on at that specific point in time. Just get your work done. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. uh, it really speaks to like uh, modern concepts of like hybrid work where, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, get your work done. Like yep. what's assigned, like be, be dependable in terms of like the work output. And you gotta be a little proactive too. Like I feel like with especially junior workers, there's this thing where you'll give an assignment, they'll take one stab at it. And if it doesn't land, they'll be like waiting for oh, intervention. I don't we know think of this as barricade removal. Like, so barricade this, this is something that, that like, uh, like, you know, you teach a lot, um, and you work through like, uh, when I was in the Marines, which is. Uh, part of your job as a supervisor, as a non-commissioned officer, like, uh, you know, which, which, uh, which I was, is, uh, is about removing obstacles to success. Nice. And, I like and I really think that's what management is, is really fundamentally about. Well, and I agree, right? I mean, especially like leadership, you know, like my job when I'm running a project is to essentially get people the resources they need to succeed. Like, right. Establish the vision. Way. Yeah. Set the, set the standard, set the goal. Yeah. Um, provide the resources and just remove barriers to success. Completely agree. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I like barricade removal. I might start using that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. sweet. Thank you. Um, the uh, although, like that, that reminds me of um, the uh, um, in the army. Um, we did a lot of work with the, with the army at CRL. The uh, specifically for combat engineers, they called that maneuver support. Like whenever you were removing obstacles to success, whenever you were providing, you know, a new route or something like that, um, you know, or, or like, you know, penetrating a, 
you know, minefield or something like that. They called that, you know, maneuver support, maneuver right. enablement, right? But it's the same thing. It's, it's barricade removal. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. So would one way around that be like defining the goal? Like, listen, it's going to be difficult. If you don't get there, don't be discouraged. There are other ways to get there. Oh. Keep trying. Ask for help if you need it. Yeah, great, great question. So I think, you know, one of, one of the, uh, at the end of the day, there's, you've got the full spectrum from setting the objective and then freeing people all the way down to micromanagement. And, you know, one of, one of the things that, um, um, that I learned in the Marine Corps, which is actually quite, quite different than the army. And I'm sure we'll get some comments about this on, on LinkedIn. Um, please send all hate mail. <laughs> the, uh, no, uh, hate mail can, uh, you know, can, can tag me. The, in, in the Marines, um, the commander's intent in a mission statement is the most important part. So basically, when you get a mission, you're getting an objective like, you know, like, uh, you know, all right, Corporal Krauss, like you're going to take your squad. You're going to execute an ambush at location X, Y, Z um, at this time. That's the objective. In order to, this is, now follows the commander intent, oh, in order to deny the enemy the ability to use that main supply route. Okay. So your real mission is to is, deny is the enemy the use of the main supply route. That's right. Yeah. So if you're, let's say you're walking along the road, you're on the way, you see trucks approaching, they look like bad guys, you hop in the bushes, you ambush them, you fulfill your objective because you honored the commander's intent. Even though you didn't do the first thing Correct. because you found another way to get to the second thing. I think this is something that we miss a lot in engineering. We love to overdefine, and we love to overconstrain a problem <sighs> set. Brutal. And, right. And so... Um, it's a big problem. I mean, with... Well, it, it goes to requirements even, like for whole companies will attack the wrong If we back all the way up to, to we back, when we go above the requirement, what's before the requirement is the operational or use case statement, right? And so if you always refer back to the operational case or the intended use, then you have the commander's intent. You understand when there's a requirement that you should challenge and when there isn't. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you don't have the context to challenge your requirement. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess in my work at SK, we've come across clients that underdefined the, what did you call the operational objective? Yeah. And or, or the requirement. I mean, yeah. this is very common. Well, sometimes you'll get like a, like a very, like you said, just narrowly defined goal. And I'll often ask as an account representative, like, why is it you want us to hit that goal? What is it that we're trying to accomplish here? You know, what's the market? Who's going to be using this? Right. Because sometimes, like, your client, I don't want to say has it wrong because that's not correct, but they haven't seen all the different ways that, you know, maybe we can help them. And, and you're not using people's full brain if you scope them into. Or they may just be so close to the problem that they've been dealing with at hand that they only see it the same way. You might be right about that. Um, yeah. Tunnel vision occurs when you're right. seeing anything for a while. I mean, that's that one's difficult. I mean, that gets into customer management and everything else. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it's our job as um, service providers yep. to um, be stewards of a client's um, resources, money, and intent. Yep, I agree. And so, like, even when, you know, when, when we see those things, that, that might be an opportunity to um, go outside the normal or attack a problem a different way, um, I think... You know, it's often as much our job to inform a client as otherwise. Um, an analogy for that in the uh, um, in the Marines, like we, um, um, I keep bringing it back to Marine Corps because I'm not very bright, so like I, I have a very like, limited you, you're set some kind of, genius, of things like, that I can go back to. But the <laughs> um, uh, so in the Marines, we treat weapon systems as Cruiser, all weapon systems is cruiser weapons other than a rifle. Cruiser weapons, okay, got it. Cruiser weapons. So like, you know, uh, oops, so like That's medium machine gun, right? Medium machine gun, minimum like uh, um, uh, three-man squad, minimum. Okay. Um, and then you employ it. Now, your What's job, a heavy machine gun versus a medium machine gun? A uh, heavy machine gun is really caliber-based. So like a heavy machine gun is like a 50 caliber machine gun. And above. Or a Mark 19. Okay. Yeah. Which is a grenade launcher. Uh, grenade, yeah, grenades, automatic grenade yeah, launcher, 40 millimeter grenades. High pressure, 40 millimeter 40, grenades. 40, okay. Yeah. Um, and the um, versus like a medium machine gun is going to be a 7.62 by 51 if you're NATO. Okay. got it. Um, if you're, um, you know, former Soviet, like, uh, um, you know, shooting Russian... You know, your um, 
uh, your 762 by 59. 54? Uh, oh, 54, 54 belt yeah. bed, yeah. So the, um, um, so that, that's medium, right? You go down to light and you're at like, you know, 556. Five, yeah. um, so the... Um, 762 by 39 would also be considered light. It would be light. Okay. It would be it. light. Lower pressure. Yeah, yeah it makes would sense. be light. Although that'll shoot through a wall in our 556 five, wall, but regardless, <laughs> different conversation. So the... Uh, uh, one of the things that we were, that was drilled into us as young NCOs that were weapons squad leaders and section leaders was that um, uh, a large source of our job was informing our unit commander of the right way to use us. So, Interesting. And not to assume that they knew how, right? No, to be respectful, but then, so you have that second or first lieutenant who's like, hey, Sergeant B, take your, you know, like for me, an assault, assault element, which uh, could be javelins or smalls, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, go do X, Y, Z. And it's like, you know, hey, sir, our javelins can go over here. They could shoot 2.7 kilometers to infinity. And the, uh, you know, our smalls are really best in that 250 to 400 meter range. Like, let's sense. do this. You know, maybe we can employ ourselves like that. You work on the weaponeering with them and then you employ. I feel like our jobs is robotics like that's you know developers is so very it's like similar tactics and strategy you're trying to find a place to meet basically yeah like they they have a business objective they're trying to yeah you know a customer's got but a if that's disconnected objective. from the reality of what it takes to execute that objective then it might be misinformed right and so okay i've been there in business but you don't want to let them run down a road where you know they're over developing themselves into a corner um and they're not going to be able to back their way out of it whether it's through their architecture of, you know, their AI in the cloud versus on edge or the um, uh, the hardware architecture they're leveraging, yeah. you know, et cetera. Like you want to be able to inform them. We've done that. I call that negotiating scope, scope all mm. the time. It's a good way to put it. So, I mean, you, you have, have to back, back off, you have, you have to, to back, back it off sometimes if the, if the customer over defines and you have to give them a reason. Like, like what if instead we did this because, because you know, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Of a time we've done that. A lot of times it's budget related. So I feel like someone will come to us with that. They want, I mean, you've experienced this, like they want everything, but they've only got, you know, like X amount of dollars to spend on it. And you're like, well, we could probably get you, you know, three out of the six degrees of freedom you want. And right. maybe we'll have to downscope accuracy from two degrees to, or sorry, half a degree to two degrees. Is that acceptable? You know, and It'll unlock more technologies, and we have a higher probability of success. And then we can try to dial it in, obviously, but you know, then we know we can hit your budget. That's yeah, um, would that work? You know, my friend Bill Ross, um, who was one of the founders of uh, of Carnegie Robotics, worked at worked at NREC for years and years. Um, had had some huge successes, like uh, um, uh, quality control high-speed machine vision, Kieran Beer Label Inspector, and um, the... Um, Kieran Beer Label. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and um, um, in the day. And um, I did a bunch of work for uh, Continental um, on uh, automotive sensors and, and things like that. Um, he was at Uber early on um, as well when, when that all went down. He's uh, he's an upstate New York guy, Does the um, is involved in that great illuminated like like ice house that uh, that they build up there every year. I haven't I haven't seen. Is that the hotel? Or is um, that the uh, a different thing. I'm trying to remember what which uh, which town he's in. Bill, which town are you in? Hit me on LinkedIn <laughs> and tell us like down in the comments. Carl, um, put it on the text on the like, bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, like um um, but um, uh, that's Bill's only, great. That's only if we get it before it gets released. That's and right. We can edit that in. Otherwise, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll fix this. It'll, it'll um, just be wrong forever. The uh, um, you should have Bill on. Bill's a character. Yeah, if you um, introduce me and remind me, we can. Do oh, that. absolutely! Like he's he's a lot of he's a lot of fun. The um, um, I wonder what he's up to these days. But um, you know, Bill Bill was the first person that I had heard the uh, um, you know projects are all triangle, right? Was the uh, fast, good, and cheap? Right. Yeah. Right. Or as Been he there. put it, like. Um, um, uh, performance, performance cost for schedule, right? Yeah, like that. Yeah, like like pick pick two or whatever. I had, um, to, I had to have that conversation with clients a couple of times. Like I'm sure you have too. Yeah, it takes a lot of tact to have that conversation correctly. 
Like correct. Yeah. Uh, because the thing the thing that's left out there that nobody really talks about is risk. Like there's schedule risk, there's there's technical risk, um, there's cost risk, and yep. risk become issues, and then the unforeseen happens. And you know one of the things that we've run into like over and over again when when we were at CRL and at Enric, um was just clients that failed to understand that the only reason why you know an NREC or a CRL would tackle a problem is because it was high technical risk. And so like, and just having a different scale that you're using in terms of vocabulary, I think is a lesson that I took away from, um, from, from both of those places, which is when you start a new project with a client, sit down and agree on what low, medium, high risk means. <laughs> technically cost wise and schedule wise. That's clever. And, and just be like, look, um, when I put on a risk register that some things like high schedule risk, what does that mean to you? And they're like, we'll miss a week. And I'm like, for me, it's missing a year. Right. And so yeah. you've got to negotiate that. What is low risk if a week is high risk? Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So we've had to, we've asked clients to prioritize, uh, their, their require. So like we're asked to meet these five objectives, but the schedule is very tight. And we're like, okay, those five objectives are all individually addressable, but if you had to pick, you know, your left arm or your right leg, like which would you choose? Like, oh, we don't want to pick, you know, I want We both. need a both. Yeah, we yeah. need a both. Well, we're going to try to get you everything. No, it's a track but... ground vehicle and flies. Like, uh, <laughs> you didn't know? Like, yeah. and uh, it's also perfectly uh, indoors and out of doors. Like, it's also yeah. incredibly light. <laughs> That's Lighter right. than air, really. Oh, and so small. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and it'll run for a year without a charge. Oh, yours can't is that yeah that's um yeah exactly um yeah i think you know one of one of the things that um everything always winds up being hard when you're dealing with hardware like hardware's hard right yep. um and you know especially as you go into optimization for product, right? Which was something that I didn't have as great an appreciation of before, like doing low volume stuff. Yeah, I'm like, still in that world very much. Yeah, moving into high volume and, and you're like, uh, um, it's, uh, it's a different game. It's a different game, it's exciting. So That's it's interesting. I, yeah, I've been wanting to kind of play around with that a little more. Yeah, we've had, we've had some really interesting um, things lately at uh, um, a Hellbender that have been eye opening, right? So like you can imagine um, you know, back in the old days, like, like at, at NREC, you're working on, working on a project, you find out late in the game that you have this massive, um, you, you've got a bunch of cameras, you have MIPI interference that just happens to be outputting at 1.5 gigahertz and, oh crap, what do you know it? That's L1 GPS is at one point, you know, 1.575 and, um, I need GPS too. And what are you going to do to mitigate that? How are you going to get around it? Like things like that, and you have to come up with. You have to come up with. Can you run the MIPI at a different frequency? I wonder. Uh, actually, you can. Um, That's that does what a, I would that do. does a little bit. It does okay. a little bit, but at the end of the day, you're going to hurt your data rates. So depending yeah, on what you're sense. trying to achieve, yeah. So you can like you can clock pin and things like that. Um, you, okay. you run into this problem a lot with uh, USB three too. Yeah, USB um, three has been a fucking. Oh, uh, it's a disaster. Sword in the side. <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's so a many disaster. Projects. But the. Um, you know, for us, of course, we, we attack the problem early on, like through discovery, like the impedance uh, matching requirement, like, ah, I don't mind. No, yeah, no, no, no. Actually, yeah. it's it's all involved, right? So we had this we had this project. We're doing a we're doing a camera, um, prosumer type mapping camera, uh, yeah. for a client. Um, great client. Like they'll have a, a launch here pretty soon that we're we're excited about. Um, awesome. And the, um, um, yeah, for that, like we had this. We inherited a prototype design that was done previously, and our mandate was making a product. So, you know, hey, shame on me. Like, I didn't have the, the budget wherewithal to go back and start to challenge everything again. Like, I was there to make a product out of that. So, how many assumptions can we stack up on one sheet of paper? Like, all of them here, Spencer, right? <laughs> like, um, you know, I assume that it works, that everything works at the same time, that, you know, the performance is good enough, da 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 right? Um, brutal uh, many of which weren't true like doesn't matter um, so now you're taking a step back from production you have to go into new product development and then back we can into solve that, that. And then we get to dive back forward in a way mm -hmm. that we can still do volume production brutal um, brutal and the um, you know so in this case 
uh, we were using a Raspberry Pi high quality camera, which we should be announced as a Raspberry Pi design partner this Dude. summer. Yeah, no, super exciting. Congrats. Super, thank you. Yeah, super excited about that. Um, is that and, okay to we put on the podcast? Or is uh, that... Yeah, why not? Like, so, um, the uh, they're already introducing us to potential clients. Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's official. Roger, if it's not official, like you let me know, okay, buddy. Like uh, yeah. I love you. Um, <laughs> Should we run this by by the team? Before? No, we're fine. Okay. And um, <laughs> so the hey, Roger, uh, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, it's uh, it's all water <laughs> under the bridge. Um, and the um, uh, yeah, so so we re were using. Um, the Raspberry Pi high quality camera, um, brilliantly designed device, great. Sony IMX 477. If you need a 12 megapixel imager, like, mm, chef's kiss. Um, That's cool. The, uh, what does one of those run? Like uh, 50 one? bucks. That's at the single quantity. Yeah, single quantity. Cool. Well, so interesting thing about Raspberry Pi, um, the, uh, oh, they don't do price breaks like over, at all? over schedule. Um, I haven't hit the volumes that, that allows for uh, for. Not price even like ten k, right? Like, uh, ooh, we ordered sixty five thousand. Fuck, and you still get a price break? No. Brutal. And we're buying direct from Raspberry Pi, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and, that's uh, that's an interesting way of doing it, right? Because it must be like a super awesome product if they don't have that. It's an amazing product, yeah. and I it, why they you know it goes that. to their and it goes to their foundation, okay. and you know helps the um, helps the mission, which which we're. You know, 100% behind. I guess it's um, probably for accessibility to the little guy so that, you know, you don't... Yeah, I think it's a mix, right? So our rep, um, uh, who we buy through, is uh, over in Columbus, um, Ohio, uh, Samantha cool. Snyder. Hey, Samantha. Um, the uh, Who works for who works for Pi, and she fights for us, like, in their allocation meetings cool. um, and everything else. And the uh, and so we're buying Raspberry Pi CM4s, and we're buying... Um, uh, and, we're, and we're buying the Pi high-quality cameras. Cool. Um, and we sold IP to Raspberry Pi. Nice. Yeah, which was exciting for one pound uh, sterling. Um, but <laughs> that's I feel not a sale. What? No, it's a sale. It's sales a sale. Sales a sale. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> uh, it's uh, um, it was uh, consideration. So nice. We wanted them to have an M12 adapter instead of a CS adapter on the. Why? Raspberry why Pi. couldn't you just give it to them at that price? Uh, they insisted on providing us compensation for it. It was more defensible Interesting. Um, from an intellectual property standpoint Okay. Um, in Britain and Europe. And, uh, and and we honored that. And so um, it's why we can now take credit cards on Stripe. Sweet. As our first sale. That's um, awesome. So um, so thanks, guys, for uh, for buying our M12 mount. Um, but the, uh, uh, yeah, so the to the best of my knowledge, like in relatively low volumes up through 65000 like you pay the same price. As what you would get from a. Um, um, if you get a price break at sixty five thousand, I don't think there's a price break. <laughs> well, there's a price break. I mean, yeah. their distributors have to get them, but we're not a distributor, yeah. right? Yeah. We're uh, we're an integrator. Um, so the uh, I think if you're looking at like a Digikey, you know, um, who's an authorized distributor, like how, well, they Digi-Key, have to make some I mean, money. Are they buying more than that? Like how are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but. Us buying direct from Raspberry Pi lets us be lets us have a voice at the table through Samantha. Cool. Um, to make sure that like in those allocation meetings, our interests as as the little guy who's trying to make like like Pi Power products like uh, are respected. Sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's exciting. So anyway, so um, um, so maybe problem. So so the uh, um, so the stock cable that comes with the Pi high quality camera um, is not impedance matched. Brutal. Uh, brutal, right? Although they have chokes on the uh, um, on the connector, which is great. That's a and ribbon it, cable, though, from it is. Okay. It's a ribbon cable. How do you choke a, a ribbon cable um, on on the receiving end of the board. Okay. Uh, although you could do it in a, in a clever uh, flex cable design. Interesting. Yeah. So the uh, so what we ended up doing, um, which which I think is is quite fun, we mimicked their chokes on our carrier board, which you know will come out. Soon, actually, we'll have a um, this fall. We'll have a family of Hellbender products that are Sweet. OEM integratable, like Raspberry Pi carrier boards. People That's can awesome. buy and, and put in their industrial products. I'm excited about that. Um, and excited. the um, um, but um, our principal electrical engineer, uh, Dave Pacella, who is um, um, uh, best EE that that I've ever worked with. Uh, awesome, um, hands down. Um, the uh, uh, so he came up with. Uh, um, his very first flat flex cable design is this um, really clever uh, shielded 
with this um, um, film you called... You shield a flat flex cable. With the coating. Interesting. And vias. And laser vias. Laser on a cable? On a cable. Where do you put the vias? Um, in the cable. What? Yeah, so you do polyamide, um, copper, um, polyamide, then I'm not sure I'm familiar copper. with polyamide. Um, oh, so uh, any flat... Any of the orange colored five yep. flexes, that, that's, that's, that's polyamide. Okay, got it. Right, <clears throat> and so you can do laser vias to tie tie grounds through I multiple what layers. Was. Cool. Yeah, it's oh, it's slick, right? Yeah. Um, but then there's this coating called uh, Tatasuka, and the Tatasuka shielding is like it's crazy efficient, right? Ninety percent as efficient as like full metal shielding, like canning it. Um, and is that so one of those silver paints like you get from uh, what's their dicks. Um, it's it's like those coatings. It's okay. like a super shield that you super would get shield, from. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so like super shield is uh, um, that's like what a copper and copper and silver or copper and tin tin spray paint mix that that um, that you can get like from dollar from like a letter tech. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like um, so, this is a jet black coating. So when you open your phone up, cool. Whatever phone you've got, and you tear it down and you're replacing the battery, I and will you not see, be doing that with my phone. <laughs> Oh, I highly recommend it when you decide that you're done with your phone. Yep. Like it's it's. Uh, I've got a bunch of Pixel Two XLs. Are those new enough to have that? Or? Yeah, actually, I think my Pixel Three had Tatasuka, a Tatasuka like coating, like cool. a gray black coating, on a bunch of its flat flex cable. Because you can imagine, like um, a cell phone has all of the problems. It's yeah. got tons of cameras, like with MIPI CSI two and four lane. Um, you know, it's got it's got GPS. Like it has. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, you know, um, near field charging, um, you know, near field response for cash registers, um, you know, like the, the, the whole nine yards, GNSS, and the uh, all of those things want to be shielded from each other. That makes sense. To, to just for electromagnetic compatibility. Yep. Yeah. When we did a teardown of... Um, do you have uh, to ground the shield? You do. So that's where the vias come in. That's where the vias come in. That's interesting. Yeah. Why not just via? Why multiple vias? Uh, like, wouldn't you have a ground loop? So, so there's there's different ways there's different ways to do it. I'm not an electrical engineer, so I'm not going to dive in. Yeah, me and, neither. I'm just kind of speculating. And say that I know how, but the um um I I think the right way is making, you know, at the at the end of the day, I I in a very layman's way think about a lot of um EMI issues with how much flow can you get through a pipe? And, you know, if in your noise sources are where you have choke points. And so it's so, okay to parallelize grounds if you... In certain ways. Okay. In certain ways. That's interesting. You should have David Shell on and have him talk about that. Yeah, if you want to introduce... He's an audio... He is dying to have a small spin out of our company do high-end audio maker equipment and things oh, like that. Oh, interesting. I, I could introduce them to our audio engineer. Oh, that that could be uh, may, maybe you have a one-off. Yep. Like, uh, have, have him on. Have him, have him geek out. Um, yeah. He'll love the Marantz gear. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So the, uh, but in any case. Bryce uh, and Hollis, thanks for setting all this up. <laughs> <laughs> shout out. So the, um, um, so we were able to do some things, you know, we, we were able to work with Pi, um, uh, on noise, we were able to work with uh, um, Tau Glass, the uh, Irish designer and manufacturer of the of the GNSS antennas that we were using. There's a great company down down in North Carolina called Connected Development that helped a lot with uh, um, with tuning our our Pi bridge, our ESD oh, cool. filter, um, and our antenna antenna and uh, ground plane tuning, and um, uh, and then we did a lot of noise isolation. Res and luckily, like since we have our own PCBA, like in house, like we could, like dramatically change the uh, the PCB layout, um, minimally change the components. Interesting. And we're running five days later. That's cool. Like at at you Can know. Can you silk screen though with your setup? Yeah. Um, although typically, what you do is you you get the silk screening done um, at your board house. So we use a couple of board houses. The best board house that we use is actually local. Oh, interesting. Uh, best board house we use is down in Washington, PA. They're uh, SMG. SMG Global. I may have been in their facility. They're the second generation um, uh, PCB spinners. Cool. 
and they'll they'll do five day domestic turns for you at That's very awesome. very reasonable prices. Okay, so you let them re resilk, and then you go from there. Yep. So we'll we'll send them the changes. Like uh, they'll spin it. Like we fall, we do our best to fall within their design guidelines, and then uh, uh, within five days, like we've got new panels and we're running them on the line. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Can I pour you a whiskey, by the way? Yeah, I'll take a whiskey. Absolutely. I'm too Irish and Scottish to say no. Cheers. Cheers. That's about the same. Good enough. Good enough. Hmm. So, not to get too tangential, but before we started, you wanted to ask me about my car exploding. <laughs> please, please, please <laughs> let me know um, what you're doing about that. So over the weekend, for people listening, um, my car went up in flames while I was in its carport. And uh, yeah, I'm currently looking for a new car. So This was really too bad because the last time I was here, we actually, um, um, after the podcast, we walked outside and talked for quite some time about um, rust prevention in yep. Western Pennsylvania and how to keep older Japanese cars on the road. Yep. And the way that I was able to do it is I went to Rust Repair Inc. in Castle Shannon. Mm, shout out. Shout out, Rust Repair Inc. And uh, they sprayed motor oil with a thickening agent on the bottom of my car. It's probably a little bit illegal. And uh, it's been sweet. Like, it's... it's. They didn't do lanolin. Uh, they might have some kind of petroleum product. What is lanolin? So lanolin is wool. Interesting. I had never heard about this um, because I'm an ignorant cracker. But the... Um, <laughs> so Adela Wee... Um, my co-founder. Yeah. Um, so she's into MGs. Like an MG midget. Uh, yeah. Okay, so cool. she is she is an MGB. Sweet. Um, and uh, rallies it. And, Those and are everything. badass cars. Uh, they are. They are. And um, the uh, you know she she and her partner Eli have um, they did what any sane uh, group of car crazies do. They bought an MGB. She bought an MGB before she knew how to drive stick. Um, and like uh you know taught herself on it um and then immediately bought another mgb nice and uh to make up uh, for to the parasite clutch. to make <laughs> I, I don't i don't know i to to make up for a lot i mean those are you know those that that's a vintage car like um yeah. 1974 Fidella. like was it before the good bumper after the good bumper i can't remember <laughs> um but the uh was there when she bought it um she bought it from a uh um was he a retired airline pilot i'm trying to remember but the um um, great car, a lot of fun. Sweet. And the um, um, sh the rust proofing that she did was um, lanolin because we had somebody somebody worked me to comment about it how it smelled like like just like a wet sweater or something. Inter okay, that's not what they're using. It's definitely motor oil with a thickening agent. Rust repairing. I think until my truck this. was done but the um it's effective definitely not lanolin lanolin sounds like the environmentally responsible thing i'm to, not against uh, it. if it works and it's cleaner and it costs about the same i mean i don't i don't, I don't care i don't mm. need to say f you to the environment i, I thought i thought so it was just a british thing like uh you know it's for good luck it's like witchcraft right yeah. they're um you know what well, so why is it right? it's all volvo racers so these guys <laughs> have like these junk together Volvos, like they'll have like a key fob like wired into their harness. It's hilarious. Like just to get the thing to start. And then uh, they're just, I guess they were like doing that and need to pay for their race habits. So they started this business just undercoating cars. And it's great, you give them like five to 700 bucks depending on your car. And then you have seven years of them like retouching it up every year. Ooh, nice. They'll hit it with a needle gun and they'll spray it down. And, uh, you gotta totally scale it. it. You gotta scale it with a needle gun. Yeah, exactly. Or or your bunch of jags, and yeah, uh, that's not fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I, I'm gonna take my next car to these guys. They're awesome. <laughs> that's fantastic. Pretty much for every car I own, as long as I live in Pittsburgh, unless they shut down. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's, it's too much salt. Yeah, yeah that's all there is to it. It's brutal. I'm also looking in the south. If anyone in the south has a LS uh, four sixty Lexus. Please give me a call. That's the one I'm looking for. What year? Uh, two thousand eight to two thousand thirteen is when they made those. How so many you can, miles? You, you can still for? get them like under a hundred k is one. So you can still get them with like relatively low mm -hmm. mileage for a decent price. I mean, if you can get them outside of uh, outside of the Northeast and bring them in, yeah, that's the plan. So I'm like trolling Atlanta. I'm like you know trolling like uh, like at, you know Austin, Texas, Houston, Texas. 
Charleston, North Carolina. I, I don't know. I don't know if they, they're an assault city or not. Like, Well, you know... Um, I was just like Google Maps checking all the cities in the South. Well, I guess you could pick it up by just flying down there or the uh, you could take the train. You could Amtrak I, I, it. I want to do that now that you've told me it's an option. So the... Um, um, shout out to uh, our Amtrak president, like uh, like Joe Biden. Um, the uh, if you haven't, folks, if you haven't been in a roomette overnight on an Amtrak train, are you really an American? What is a roomette? So a room, so so a roomette. I'm not American. This is uh, no, this is amazing. Communist. Like, um, <laughs> um, you know, get maybe it's the opposite. The uh, um, so so a roomette is uh, um, when you get out of the the main coach cars, yep. right? You get into the sleeper cars. The sleeper cars have a number of different, like, bedrooms. Um, the uh, There's even, you know, you have the bedrooms that don't have any restroom facilities. There are um, roomettes, which are two seats that face each other. And they're really nice seats. They fully recline. There's a fold-out table in between them. Sweet. There's a bunk bed above. Cool. And then they fold flat. Um, so the way that I always travel to, and my wife and I, and um, and when we bring our daughter along, um, travel to Chicago, because Chicago's just fun. Um, not from Chicago. From I love Chicago. Philly, but Chicago's great. Yeah, like, I've always had a good time there. Chicago's great. Like, yeah. when, when we go to Chicago, you could go, you can get on a train at midnight here in Pittsburgh, like, get on a sleeper car, go to sleep, you wake up at 7.30 in the morning, you have breakfast, Spencer. Seriously? Yeah. They just bring it to you? It's a part of your first class ticket. That's cool. a sleeper car. Um, you can take a shower. There's a... Uh, There's a shower? There are individual showers per sleeper car. There's a fucking... You get your own shower? You don't get... you. Well, so so on the, on the, on the three-bedroom ones on the upstairs, there's a mixed shower. You shouldn't use it. You should use the common showers. They're in the basement. They're in the on the first floor, the two floor. The sleeper cars are two floors, um, and the uh, so you've got a series of these showers. They all lock. They're great, right? right? They're freaking amazing. Like That's take awesome. a shower on a train, like, like while you're moving. People <laughs> take a shower on a train, right? Um, That's cool. And the uh, you know just do your hair you're like you're good. Um, uh, if you got it, we don't. But if you do, bald, and bald um, over here. get your get your breakfast, uh, get your work on. Um, nice. And then, like eight in the morning, you're in frickin' downtown Chicago. You didn't waste any time effing with the airports. Like <laughs> you didn't spend any time in a cab. You're fucking there, bro. Yeah. Like, like you just won. Like that was. That's awesome. uh, that is that is what the trains are really all about. You can just step on. You don't have to go through security. None of that crap. No, like like yeah. you go. Um, you have to pay like fifteen hundred bucks for a private plane. No, what? so it's it's two hundred bucks. Two hundred bucks, you get your own. Two hundred bucks than a fucking flight. It's a freaking motel room. Yeah, it's the motel room when you get there. And you're early there for a meeting. You're, you're there. There, you're moving you're in the motel there. room. It is. I freaking love the train. Okay, um, I might do that to get my car. It's uh, you got you got to try this out. You can do it in a bunch of. I would places. love to do that and end up in Atlanta, just like to like go to sleep in Pittsburgh and end up in the dirty south. Are you uh um are you a bicyclist? I uh, I am yes. So the um. Um, and like, uh, there's, so there's a bunch of exciting things in robotics and bicycles that Ooh, we I didn't desperately need to talk about Yeah, like, please. like on this, on this pod, but, um, that same route, the opposite way of that route, it's called the Capitol flyer. It goes from Chicago cool. to DC, comes through cool. Pittsburgh, right? We're the midpoint. Nice. So what you can do is you can also get on in Pittsburgh and you can go to DC and then you can ride the gap back or you can get off in like Cumberland. And just ride part way back. Maryland, I think. Yeah. Cool. And um, and you can uh, you can check a bike. Cool. And the fun thing about a sleeper car is it's as much luggage as you can shove into your sleeper. That's thing, awesome. And nobody checks it. Nice. Not that you're ever going to take anything inappropriate on a train. Yeah. Well, That's I mean, not something that no, I never, do. never would I do that ever, uh, ever, ever. But you don't need to worry about batteries. Yeah. Lithium ion batteries. <laughs> you could bring a Pelican case with your robot. I mean, you could do so many different things. Uh, I went to a trade show. Um, I, I talked a bunch of us um, into uh, taking the train. They know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> I talked. I talked a bunch of a bunch of us into uh, going to a trade show in Chicago, on and back on the train. We had a That's blast. That's a cool convention center they got there. Oh my god, the McCormick. Yep, it's love amazing. It. Love it. It's, it's amazing. It's massive. It's, it's huge. Amazing. 
It's so big. Good. Nothing like seeing a bunch of cleaning products. And was this ISA you went to? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. ISSA. Oh, this yeah. must. I know what you did. The, the, with uh, Nilfisk. Yeah, with Nilfisk. With yep. uh, with the Liberty. Yeah. I worked on the competitive Carnegie Robox project. Oh, <laughs> is that right? I did. They went under, but I, I helped before they did. Hey, that uh, that 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 stuff that stuff happens. But the yeah. um, um, Intellibot. Uh, it would have been the FX250 at the, the time. F oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They, I think they changed the name at one point. But, mm -hmm. uh, no, the... Um, uh, that's Scrubba, fun. then it went to the FX250, and then they might have changed it after that again. Yeah, it, um, um, so on, yeah, yeah, on our end, on the Nilfisk end, like that turned into, the Nilfisk Carnegie Robotics end, that turned into um, a company called Thorough AI, which is based here, cool. like out of, uh, out of Pittsburgh. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So. Small cool. world. Yeah, really exciting. So bikes. Yep. Um, so there's something really exciting in in in, uh, in bikes and bike safety going on, and there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of comments about it. But um, Clark Haynes, who another CMU alum, uh, worked at NREC. Like back in the day, he was um, software lead on the DARPA Robotics Challenge, cool. the Chimp. Which oh yeah, another one. Yeah, and he's done a lot of a, a lot of work in ag, etc. But when when he joined Uber. Uh, he was really the head of... Uh, uh, they made their own custom brushless motors for that, right? Yeah, they did. I was impressed with that. Have you uh, have you talked to anybody about that? Have you talked to the designer? I know a few folks on the team, uh, but not the guy you're talking about in particular. Um, so um, David Rice and Morgan Jones did the motors, to the best of my knowledge. Cool. Um, and um, uh, both amazing guys. That's awesome. And... Um, uh, yeah, just the ambition in doing that. I mean, like, it's not a thing you normally make yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why did they do that? We don't. We don't have enough lives to have the number of companies that should exist out of uh, out of that one project. Um, that was an amazing, amazing project, and the the it's like a who's who um, of its own, right? Like you've got um, on the DARPA side. Um, you know, you had uh, um, Gil, who's at, who's on the DARPA side, who's now, um, I see the technology lead at Toyota Research for AI, um, Gil Pratt. I'm trying to remember. I think he is. Um, big brain. Um, exciting project manager. Don't know him personally. Um, the, uh, you know, my hofer, like all the Lab 37 crew, um, the, the, uh, David Rice, like genius lunatic, um, the uh, yeah, some hybrid of a Western Pennsylvania and a Texan, like fascinating individual. Yeah. Um, all the Rices are super intense, impressive individuals. I've been of these guys. Yeah, um, I'd like to. yeah, that's that's uh, your loss. I'll make some introductions. Yeah, we'll see if any of them come on. Um, the uh, they'd be great. They're they're super fun. Um, but uh, no, so um, so Clark Haynes when he joined. When he, when he joined Uber, he was working mostly running um, uh, vehicle prediction. So trying to figure out what the other cars were going to be doing. Interesting. Different level of machine learning and AI, right? Yeah. Um, and so he has a new company called Velo AI. I've and heard of them. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're super exciting. So they're doing, they're doing camera-based... Um, camera um, uh, machine learning um, on the fly to provide vehicle safety like for bicyclists. That's so, well, uh, yeah. Yeah, really exciting stuff. That's, how does that, I mean, can you say how that even manifests? Or? Well, I mean, the, um, like when we, when, when you dive down into it, I mean, what, he, what he's looking for are um, the, uh, the neural nets are looking for visual clues that like, like a car is threatening the, the rear end of bicycles. Okay. So he had done some What studies. do you do about it once you determine it's there? Um, well, ideally, you would, um, you know, call a jag off a jag off, right? But the, um, but we, but we live in a, in a polite society. So the, so basically we can think about it as a neural net that runs and then honks a horn and flashes lights to try to grab that driver's attention yeah. before that driver engages the bicycle. in, uh, yeah, before, no, before the, before the driver of the car that's threatening the bicycle, like engages in that that bad behavior, so you're trying to predict that the car is threatening the bike, and then the the bike. When you the say device, threatening, you mean consciously? 
Or unconsciously. Okay. Inattentiveness. Yeah. Yep. Like, that makes more sense. I would I would expect that most of it's inattentiveness. Yeah. Like yeah, I believe that. Like he had he had shown me some studies where the um, um, where traffic fatalities overall are down, but fatalities of bicyclists are up, and it's primarily from being hit from the rear. Um, and Ooh. so, right. And so you would think, why is this happening? Right. We have safety devices on cars and things like that. And so he wanted to make a device. When I was a kid learning how to ride a bicycle. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. My dad would always teach us to ride in, in the wrong lane. So, like, we're in the U.S., you know, when you're driving, you go on the right side of the road. We would ride on the left side so we could see oncoming cars and then transition to the right side and go around them. As opposed to the expectation, yeah. which is that that they're going to see you coming, you're moving with them. Yeah. They have more time to adjust their behavior. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that in Pennsylvania, you're supposed to run against traffic and ride with traffic. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I've noticed, I was in the bike lane. I'm always terrified in the bike lane. Like, it's fucking scary. Like, when there's cars in the same lane. I'll be, I go on the sidewalk a lot of it. I know you're not supposed to, but I, I will. You're not supposed to. Yeah, but I do anyway. You're a rule breaker, Spencer. Yeah. We already know that about you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> but like, I, you know, I'm not going to hit someone. Like, I'm not an asshole. I'll slow <laughs> yeah, down. Just tease yeah. it. Just tease it. So, yeah, um, yeah so, the, uh, so the Velo device is really all about, like, helping... Um, bike commuters and people that ride on road not like on a regular basis not get hit by providing like alarms both to the bicyclist and to that, that that's pretty car. cool yeah. yeah 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 to go back to my my, my dream car the LS 460 which yeah. I may or may not get but it's the one I got my eye on right now um, one of the things I really liked about it is it's got a camera system that watches your eyes as the driver and if you start to doze off or like look away from the road or like presumably text i don't know if that's explicitly been you know espoused mm -hmm. name. it'll it'll start like breaking the car and like flashing at you and, and interdicting and so i thought that was that was a pretty cool i'm like i, I want a car that'll stop me from killing myself this sounds great it seems like a value right yeah, yeah like at sure. any cost yep um, absolutely. yeah the um i think early on in the if we hop in the wayback machine again um in the early 2000s, there was uh, in the late 2000s, there was uh, there was a program at NREC that was that was about driver attentiveness in in, uh, in semi trucks, um, and it would look it would try to you know build up cues, um, you know of what was what was causing what how you could predict driver inattentiveness in a semi truck and, and that sort of thing. They also did a snowplow project for um, um, the uh, California Highway Department, I think, um, that was very similar. Nice. Like, are you veering over the lane? Like, things like, things like That's that. That's awesome. Yeah. There was, did Roadbox do something with that, or were they something different? I can't remember. Yeah, they got sold, but I don't know what the hell they did. Mike Formica had a company that I think did something like that for some eyes, too. Mike Formica did? He had something. I can't remember what it was called, but at one point, I think he worked on that problem. Hmm. He told me on the podcast, and I'm, I'm horrible because... Oh, has he been on your podcast? He's been on my podcast. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I like that guy a lot. That's cool. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, neat. My old, my old lunch buddy from where we were both consulting innovation works before he worked there. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. We'd, we'd grab Noodlehead together <laughs> once every two months or so. Yeah, good very good. cool. Yeah, keep, yeah. keep, keep tabs on, uh, on Velo AI. Like yeah, fellow I'm interested to check it some out. Some cool stuff, yeah. And well, the, the fact that the actions, the alarms make sense, because, I mean, that's probably going to save lives. Yeah. Um, well, I love that it's AI on the edge, right? Like, yeah. it's it's deployable. It would have to be on the edge, though, because you don't want to connect your vehicle. It has to, it has to be yeah. on the edge. It has to be on the edge. I mean, like, like, shit, if that camera that I was talking about, like, reported to, like, AWS... Like, first of all, it wouldn't work in, wouldn't like, work. a bad area. No. Second of all, like, it's creepy as hell. Like, I don't want to have my like no it's embarrassing and like, you don't and you yeah. don't want you don't want to pay that that yeah. pay that level of uh bandwidth anyway yeah. right like um um no for this the um uh, the hardware engine um isn't a google coral like it's it's not an intel king bay like it's uh it's a halo 8 what it was the google coral and the halo 8 uh, so they're just ai accelerators okay right they're just they're just uh, um optimized um asics for neural nets got it okay. um and the, um, um, you know, the one that tested out the best for, uh, for, for Clark, um, and, uh, 
um, and fingers crossed, like we're in the process of, of Hellbenders in the process of applying to be a, a design partner. Nice. Like with them. Um, but uh, they're all the design partnerships. Uh, oh, it's um, I mean, this is the way the world should work, right? Like you you want you want to be able to work with people that are vetted yep. and can perform the capability that they pronounce. And so I think a lot of these, um, you know, designers, whether whether it's Raspberry Pi or whether it's like, uh, you know, Halo or others have created these, you know, design partnerships programs that basically say we pre-vetted these folks. And if you go to them and you want them to do a thing with our product, like we know it's going to work. Nice. Um, and they get um, access to resources that aren't normally available. That's awesome. Um, which is super cool. So like we're, we're working through this with, uh, um, with Halo. Um, well, there's definitely a lot of people pushing BS out there that are like, yeah, I know how to work with that. And like, well, and not yeah. only that, but there's, there's frankly yeah. a lot of hardware out there that just hasn't come to fruition yet that we've been waiting for, for years and years, you know? And so you want to be able to separate, um, you know, vaporware from, uh, from, from real hardware. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so the uh, Halo is pretty exciting. Another Israeli company. Sure. Um, the uh, um, uh, 26 tops capable tops are the, uh, um, you know, the normal metric that you utilize for like uh, capability of a neural net. What does that stand for? I'm just not as um, familiar, I guess. Christ, thanks for asking. Um, now, I, now, I, now I look like a bozo for, <laughs> for, not, um, for not being able to name it off the top of my head because oh, yeah. um, I've had a glass of whiskey. The um, um, it it has to do with the number of processes that, that that you can execute, like through your neural net. Um, but you know, you look at like um, terrible old people, terrible old people shitting. simulator, <laughs> like um, uh, something something like that. It's not like that at all. Um, so you look at like uh, um, so the right way to compare it would be to look at like um, Nvidia's Jetson TX2 okay. versus a Xavier's Tops. Yep. Yep. Um, and compare it and to then some, Nano and AGX are going to be yeah. different. Or sorry, not Nano. Um, NX versus AGX. Look at an NX. Xavier. Yeah, look at an NX. Um, you know, and, well, just stick with the NX because an NX is what's going to be deployed on Edge, right? And yep. an AGX you're going to find in a server farm. So yeah. AGXs don't matter anyway. The um, we well, see AGXs on Edge, don't you? Oh, I mean, you can like, but yeah. it's it, that's bigger a, robots. That's typically. a big ass robot. Yeah, <laughs> like. That's not a that's not a prosumer camera. Yeah, yeah, it's probably sure. not a car. That's might be. Like, I've seen cars with AGXs. It could be an a, like like an autonomous vehicle car. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, something that's like super high capital capex, right? Yep. Like two hundred fifty thousand dollar value car. Okay, makes right? sense. Right, but yeah, not like a fifty thousand right. dollar car. Correct. Yeah, so like it wouldn't make sense. No, so our target, like at Hellbender, like what what we really want to do is we want to be the outsourced hardware team for like. Um, you know, for software innovators and, you know, like AI companies that don't want to bother with the hardware side of the house. And they just want to make their hardware problem go away. Yep. So, you know, we're that hardware firmware team that can just like, let's realize that for you. And we'll make you not, we'll be your GC. Like, don't worry That's about awesome. how you want to manufacture it. Like, uh, give us some specs, um, better than specs. Give us a prototype that you have that works and we'll make specs out of that. Nice. And we'll test it, we'll challenge it and ask you questions. Um, and then the, uh, but we won't compete. Right. So like we don't have AI people like in our house, like yeah. we want, we want, we want you to trust us. So the, um, you know, for those, for most of what we do, um, it's going to be an NX like NX is great. Right. And oh, they're, they're, they're gorgeous and beautiful, but 25 Watts. Right. That's it. I, it's been a while since I've integrated one of these. I thought it was like 40 if you. Oh, it. you can push it up to 50. Okay. Um, the uh, but when you look at like um, a halo chip, it's five watts Ooh. for twenty six tops. So you can Wait, get how many like, tops to an to an NX. I you know I want to say it's in like the the forties. Okay, okay, got it. Like, but you're at four x, not two x, like That's the power pretty, consumption, okay. right? And does it um, work where if you had like two halo chips, you could achieve better yeah. performance than it? Okay, it does. I mean, you need to break up your neural net the right way. Um, okay. but um, absolutely. So the um, so there's a bunch of use cases that we're super excited about that combine a Raspberry Pi CM4, so you get this very deterministic, badass Linux machine, mm, magnifique, um, with uh, with an AI accelerator, sweet, and good documentation. 
That's right? awesome. So, yeah. Well, the high level guys probably love the fact that it runs Linux because, I mean, you, they can just you dump do, their shit on there. Do what you do. Do what you yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes, yeah, so there's there's some really exciting stuff um, that, um, um, yeah, stay tuned. Like, I think we've got, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, our plan this fall is, um, you know, so we have a carrier board designed right now that'll carry a uh, Raspberry Pi CM4 and a Halo 8 A plus E module. Oh, cool. On the same package. On the same package. It, it's, uh, um, uh, you know, basically four inches by two inches. How do you, that's impressive. How do you tie those together? How many layers? Uh, four layer. Nice. It's a four layer. Um, and then we could add things like um, we have one version that has GNSS. We have another version that has uh, LoRaWAN. Nice. Um, the, uh, um, so there's a bunch of different things that you could do with it. Uh, one camera, you know, two cameras, et cetera. Um, but the... Um, How do you tie those together in software? Like to get the Halo to talk to the RPI? Mm. It's just NEM.2. Yeah. So the... Um, um, like uh you know super simple you're engaging it um you know over spi okay like rock and roll and you guys do the firmware to make that happen because spy drivers can be challenging to write sometimes yeah so we'll we'll provide um the base image everything you need firmware side and um you know os side to get off the ground and run cool and then you know you do the high level stuff um, sweet that's so awesome. that's the that's the plan that's the goal yeah, that's the that's the business case. So we'll be announcing a couple of those this fall, and then we're doing a we're doing a chip down version that gets rid of chip the M.2. Down? Yeah, so so chip down is just a nice way of saying like we're gonna take that little uh, ball grid array package itself, just the Halo chip itself. We're gonna put it directly on a carrier, cool. and we're gonna get rid of the the whole M.2 interface. Gets the Got cost it. down. Got it. Like gets the uh, gets the number of interfaces down. Makes sense. Like um, yep. So the uh, super excited about that. Yeah. So cool. we kicked off that design in. Gosh, I know it's like the end of August, but it feels like so much later because we've been doing so much stuff. Like, uh, I was. Like, I mean, from the last time we talked, there's like at least half a dozen new things. I think things we have eight paying clients right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Like uh, twenty people in the company, and we're on pace for like uh, four and a half or five million in revenue this year. Badass. Yeah, it just like erupted. Dude, um, that's yeah. Up. No, super excited, but it's really all about um, edge AI hardware. Yep. And if the clients weren't good enough to let us do, I think there's a number of things, but but one of the key elements is, you know, the customers were really excited about allowing us to still maintain a lot as open source so we can share it between clients and just accelerate everybody's time to market. And so as one customer has a GNSS issue, another has like a camera thing they want to achieve and another one has like, you know, whatever. We can leverage each other's efforts to accelerate everybody's products. Sweet. Um, and uh, yeah, because at the end of the day, shouldn't it be their stuff, the higher level stuff that's really the product differentiator? differentiator. Yep. Yeah. So. Makes sense. And then we have, we're courting, we're courting a couple of clients in, uh, in Europe and in the US that are trying to, um, for geopolitical reasons and other, reshore um, or move to the U.S. manufacturing that's currently in China. Interesting. And I'm super passionate and excited about that. Yeah, it's a fun, fun thing to work on. Yeah, like there's so there's a mix there, right? Like um, it's totally loaded and um, um, and difficult to talk about like politically, but we're gonna do it because <laughs> we're apolitical, so it doesn't matter anyway. We're just. <laughs> couple of assholes um, yeah for sure I'll, so I'll attest to that the um um so as long as these tariffs are in place these electronics assembly tariffs um wait so can we go back a step like yeah. i'm pretty ignorant what, what electronics assembly tariffs can you explain to me what all right yeah are? so so right now like let's say you um let's pretend that you design your completely on your own um doesn't matter camera device okay edge camera device and you send it, and it's got a camera in it, um, it's got a computer, blah, 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 and you send it to the United Kingdom to get manufactured. Like you just, you know a buddy there, they make the thing. Um, you're Spencer, you know everybody. So you know a guy in London, like he's, he's got you covered. In Manchester, right? Like he's got you covered. Manchester United. He, he, may, he makes the thing, he ships it to you, okay? You're gonna get hit with zero tariffs, but you're gonna get hit with an import duty on that harmonic code. 
Interesting. And it'll be probably 5.8%. That's like camera equipment. Okay. Um, like 5.8%. So that's just How a tax. That a tariff? Uh, it's just a tax of it coming in. Okay. Um, that sounds very similar to a tariff. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Call a lawyer. Um, yeah. The, uh, um, no, not to be flip about it, but like yeah, yeah, the, um, you know. Um, it's the smart ass. There's duty free and there's duty bearing. Okay. And so I think what is different about a duty versus a tariff is the universality of it. Interesting. Like a duty hits everything under that category. And then there are exceptions where a tariff is the exception where a tariff is like a pointed attack at a very specific country oh, and yeah, what they're putting out at a much higher amount. Yeah. yeah. So if we look at China, right? Yeah. So China has a chip tariff inbound. So China, if you're going to send chips into China to get built into an electronics product from the U.S., yeah. 13%. And that's the Chinese government charging that. Yep. That's a Chinese tariff on inbound. Okay. Interesting. Let alone the duty. Okay. I don't know what the Which duty is, is on the top of my head. Okay. It, that's just a tariff. Okay. Then it gets built into a thing. The same camera. The same exact camera you had built in the U.K. Yep. All right. It comes out of there. It gets hit with the duty. 5.8 percent yeah we're gonna hit you with like uh because uh uh america you know, like we gotta we gotta pay the coast guard bro and <laughs> um they're great people and the um and then they're gonna hit you with a 25 percent assembled electronics tariff right now so 13 inbound 25 outbound yeah plus the duties so whatever it is in china then 5.8 coming back to the States. let's pretend it's 5.8 going in Right, so you're at like twenty going in, and you're at thirty coming out. All right, you get like tariffed on the tariff. Like, yeah, so you do. Compound. Yes, Jesus. Yeah, you do. All right, so I'm sorry, but like I've been selling lemonade since I was like four years old. <laughs> um, my first job was just collecting hubcaps because it's Philadelphia. There's potholes. We would sell golf balls to earn it. Like my dad Same and I deal. would go in the woods, pick up golf balls in the golf course. This is the game, up. right? Yep. Like, uh, so, um, hey, you find the hubcaps because that pothole's there, man. <laughs> like the government let that pothole be there. It's not on me. That's on the government. That's the right? spot. Like that's the spot. This is the spot. Like, so right now, like this, the spot for us what a tariff is supposed to do is a tariff is, is protector in nature and it's intended to create industry and protect industry in that host nation's country. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. All right. So like, what does that imply that we want to do? Well, if you put a fucking 25% electronics assembly tariff on Ch on inbound from China, Jeez. what you're saying is, Hey, make it in the U S for up to 25% more. Right. Well, not just 25, but well, you know, the deal, numbers compound right? look like. Yeah, yeah, it compounds and costs a good soul. We'll say that. 40? Like, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, when we look at, like, what's going back and forth, the target that we're trying to go after, like, at, at, at Hellbender with our lights out automation of electronics assembly, um, we're trying to do it and make money at 30% on the bomb. Oh, cool. So that feels well within tariff plus duty, let alone what you would pay extra for them to actually do the friggin' work. Yeah. So as long as the tariff's in place. So you're competitive. We are price competitive. Yep. If that, and now we're going to use that temporary time price competitiveness and the people that are willing to invest now to reduce their geopolitical risk in their assembly to build up our assets, capability, manufacturing, so that when that gets peeled away, we're competitive again. Nice. And let's look at it. I mean, at the end of the day, and this gets into everything. Let's get, this gets into like single payer healthcare and, you know, communist government versus capitalist government, uh, benefit corporations versus like host nation puppets, um, uh -huh. which is, which is fun. Like we, what's we, a host nation puppet? You know, what's, what's owned, by, what's owned by China? I right? see. Like when we look at China, um, and we do a lot, we buy a lot from China. Everybody does. Yep. Right? Um, the, uh, when we think about, um, just a little bit, thank you. Oh, perfect. When we think about what, what it costs China to make something, if you're a company in China, let's say like, like uh, um, 
you're going to make Shenzhen Spencer Krauss Battery Company Limited Co. Yeah. Right. Sounds Boom. Done. Um, you'll have a holding company in Hong Kong so that you can um, do, you know, uh, British law exchanges and things like that. Good, good contracts. Um, you don't have to pay health care, do you? This is news to me, but I believe you. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't have to pay health care. You don't have to pay maternity leave. You don't have to pay accidental death and dismemberment. So this is just how it works in China. This is just how it works in China. That's Got communist it. government. Those benefits come from the state. That's interesting. So the state you're just covers 40, all that shit. Bro, you're at a 40, 30 to 40% advantage floor. Just before, from that. Before we even talk about labor costs. Yeah, which is lower there for sure. Right. The gap seems to be narrowing though. That's interesting. Gap is narrowing as they come up, right? Yep. Um, but there's environmental reasons why they cost less. There's social reasons why they cost less, and, and things like that. But the I didn't um, realize the government covered like healthcare and maternity and all of that. Good grief! We are one of a very few handful of countries that don't cover healthcare. Yeah, it's like us in Switzerland. Switzerland's one of my favorite countries. Yeah, go Switzerland. Yeah, I love um, it there. The uh, but still. Um, the uh, everybody else has moved on to single payer healthcare, um, and, Interesting. and we haven't actually at, at so at Hellbender, um, we pay a hundred percent of the premiums for for family medical. Nice, because it's, it's bananas <laughs> that that we're not uh, single payer healthcare. So unfortunately, mm. we do have higher fringe costs, um, but we're trying to attack that by um, um, getting rid of those terrible fifteen dollar an hour jobs and replacing them with twenty five dollar an hour jobs. And yeah, it makes sense. So get robots to do the stuff nobody wants to do and then pay people more to program the robots. That's right. Like, who the hell should want a $15 an hour job? Like, you should want a living wage, yep. right? Like, I don't know why we're clamoring to protect these manufacturing jobs that are frankly shit jobs and that we shouldn't want our neighbors to have. Yeah, I agree. Like, I want to have I want to have my neighbors running seven or eight of my assembly cells at one time. I yeah. want them to be making 30 And that seems to be the way it's going. I mean, that's what I noticed uh, over at FormLogic, as we talked about. Yes, is absolutely. There's a lot of that. So, I mean, you know, when FormLogic's able to automate a process, they don't fire machinists. They buy more machines and yes. scale the machinist labor. That's right. Because there's not enough machinists. There's this, not, is, this is how we're going to win. There's not enough people that are able to do that. And like you said, I mean, it's the only way to compete is automation. This is how we're going to compete. Yeah. Right. So um, no, I'm 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 super excited about this. I think I think this is the right way for us to go, like as a as an industry, as a nation, like certainly as a region. Yeah, I agree. Really cool. Yeah, really really exciting stuff there. Yeah. So, yeah, and we're not the only company like doing doing stuff like that. Like there's there's companies all throughout Western PA who are who are you know starting to move in this direction and it's just exciting to be a part yeah. of that. Yeah, for sure. Well, and like automation too. I mean, in, in manufacturing is is growing. I mean, mm -hmm. but I mean there's there's barriers, right? So like a lot of company like interoperability is is a huge one and you get resistance. I mean, like Fanuc does not want to play nice with ABB, does not want to play nice with Yaskawa. Does not want to well, play they, nice they with don't, Alan Bradley. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, they don't want to operate under the theory of abundance. And, like, call me an idiot, like, but I want us to operate under the theory of abundance, which is there's a ton of freaking work out there. Like, there's enough work for everybody. Um, make a good thing. Make it accessible. Make it usable by everybody. And if you're trustworthy and you're a reliable partner, um, which we're still working on because we're new and, and young and stupid, um, <laughs> then, uh, then everybody's going to do Who well. amongst us, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, be new and young and stupid when I'm 90. Mm -hmm. I hope. There's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be old and jaded and bitter. Yeah. Still fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, different kind of fun. fun. Different kind of fun. Get yeah. off my lawn. That, yeah, exactly. Grant, Grant Torino yeah. style of fun. The, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, you know, when we, when we think about, what we want to see happen, um, you know, here in Western Pennsylvania, like over, over the next 50 years, like I think there's there's some really exciting uh, voices that are changing the way that they're investing locally, like um, um, R.K. Mellon okay. Foundation, right? I, I've, Craig Markovitz talked about this when he came on. I don't actually know a whole lot about their work. 
Oh, cool. I have, I, I didn't hear that podcast. The, um, yeah, he's a good dude. I like that guy a lot. Um, no, so so the Richard King Mellon Foundation is the largest endowment in um, uh, in Western Pennsylvania currently. Like, large large endowment. And they're, for years and years and years, they were, you know, um, instrumental in writing grants, trying to bolster manufacturing in Western Pennsylvania, um, and, and that sort of thing. And then recently... They started something interesting and new. And um, do you know Bobby Zappala? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's moved over and he's now running their social impact investing wing. Interesting. Yeah, you should have him on and just talk to him. Yeah, about that. I had Kenny Chen on, who's adjacent. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we recorded probably five hours. We got lit on on booze <laughs> and um, talked about Taiwan. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, he's he's a good dude. I like that guy a lot. I I have in my desk like uh it's for sentimental reasons like people that have crashed on my couch like i, I used to write like a uh, like hey thanks for coming by like you know like <laughs> note and then like as long as you don't write it on them in sharpie it seems like no nah, it would be on like a piece of like eight and a half by 11 <laughs> but like some people would write a response and i would save that so like kenny chen like wrote a response in pen and i like kept it in that drawer nice <laughs> so, that was very cool yeah, yeah. Um, he's a good dude i like that guy a lot Zapala, I don't know as well, but he also seems like a good dude. And the fact that he's involved in that means they're kind of similarly minded. I know they work together at Ascender. Yeah, they work together at Ascender. Um, yeah. the, uh, um, so R.K. Mellon has a number of tenants that, that are like uh, elemental and core to their, their social impact investing. But the fact that they like reached past grants and they're like, hey, you know what? We can actually use our endowment to like empower like startups and local businesses like to do these things like SoftBank level empowerment or um no uh, <laughs> you know uh, i think i think uh um you know pre a like okay. seed pre seed seed pre a so like one two million um i'd say like two two fifty or two fifty to five hundred okay like maybe maybe they do more i don't know i haven't talked to them about any of that i didn't realize um, that's what they were doing that's interesting yeah I, I think it's super interesting like the um you know they strike me as somebody that um um, you know, our company Hellbender is like um, mission and, and and ethically aligned with, yeah. and it would be like super powerful to uh, um, you know if we take investment in the future, like to uh, to get them involved. But they're you're totally I, bootstrap right now. Um, yeah, Damn. yeah, that is awesome. It's um, it's 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 awesome. Uh, but payroll comes twice a month, bro. <laughs> and you, you know you know the life with uh yep. with with chasing out invoices i tease well my, it's, it's it's my clients it's, are so good at paying their invoices oh no God. it's like, brutal i didn't have that well um, not only that but like i i feel like your level of money you can spend on sales and marketing is limited when you don't take hmm. some kind of you're no you're a thousand percent so we're yeah. um uh to date we're completely bootstrapped um the uh um, I mean the bulk of the bulk of the investment, bulk of the investment came from from um, uh, my sale of Carnegie Robotics, uh, my ownership of Carnegie Robotics, nice. which, which was great and a wonderful wonderful experience, and the um, and that's a great company. I, w- I wish them yeah. the the absolute best. Love those guys, um, and the you know we're we we keep flirting with um, revenue revenue uh, you know with profitable. Yeah. Um, so we're well, like, yeah, well, it's that thing where you have to grow ahead of need or you will stall. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And it's a, it's, it's a really tough, it's a really tough challenge when you're trying to pivot into manufacturing for the first time. Yep. So, you know, it's we, capital intensive for sure. Oh, it, it totally is. And we were, we were very fortunate. Um, the, uh, anybody that's interested in, in the process of like, uh, you know, getting a capital equipment loan from like the likes of PNC, like we were able to do it. Nice. Um, yeah, we got a we got a seven hundred thousand dollar capital equipment loan for PNC. Thank you. Um, for our PCBA line. Um, it's and a cool line. I've seen it. It's beautiful. It. We're, I'm sure it's adopted since then. Oh, and at this point, like, so from when you saw it, we were, we were using like the equipment piecemeal. Um, you know, today we ran, um, um, I think we ran, 
a couple hundred panels. Nice. Of uh, how many boards to a panel? Uh, depends. Like this today, we were. This was our first day of running this uh, um, long range radio, a LoRaWAN radio module yeah. that we designed. Um, Dave Pichella designed. Um, totally badass. It's for the Helium network. So anybody that wants to be on Helium Interesting. and use the CM4, call me. Got you covered, bro. How um, do they get a hold of you, just for people listening? Yeah. It's the, uh, um, we'll keep it secret. Um, but the... Uh, Maybe um, LinkedIn, like find Brian Byer on LinkedIn. <laughs> it's, it's uh, um, I'm there. I don't do enough. Um, but I think we probably did a dozen, probably a dozen to 16 boards a panel. Yeah. Um, so we probably put out 200 to 400 boards sweet you know and uh yeah it's exciting and then we um you know yesterday like we ran our first um um 50 panels 60 panels which would be like a dozen or no a dozen panels would be like 60 boards of a new a new design of, of a raspberry pi cm4 carrier board nice um which is super exciting yeah like how, the, do, how does that work for like qualification like do you test like I'm guessing you make you make one first, make yeah. sure it works, and then you ramp up. So you make four. You make okay. one panel, whatever yeah. one panel is, right? Yeah. So if a if a panel is a big board, like it's one. Um, if it's not, then you make however many a panel is, right? Yeah. So like in in the case of the carrier board, it was four four boards to a panel. So we do one panel, then you've got to teach up the automated optical inspector. So what it does is basically at the beginning you're you're gonna want to make sure that your stencil printer works and it's doing everything correctly. It's putting, if you're using adhesive dispensing for under component staking, you do that. Um, then it's putting labels in the right place. It goes to the pick in place. Like you run the pick plan, you're gonna rerun the pick plan and reprogram it a couple times. You've already done a tape study. So you've already put double sided tape on a board, on a panel, and you've run it and you've populated one board of that to make sure that your <laughs> alignment's all good. Then you copy that program out and you extend cool. it. It's just any cam is the same, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, and then you push it to your AOI, and your AOI is where What's a lot AOI? of work comes in. Automated optical inspection. Got it. Okay. So He's... we've got a 3D automated optical inspection. So we do, like, um, it's got DLP projectors, five-camera array. We we look at, uh, we look for solder bridges. We look That's for, cool. like, alignment on pad, like, whole nine yards. Um, That's and, awesome. Um, how, yeah, do you, so, how do you train that? Like, I, I've not set up a PCB. You need your first... You need one board of a panel done, but it's best to have a whole panel done. It could be wrong. And then you feed it in your ODBs, your Gerber files, and your 3D steps. Okay. If you've got them. And then it models well, it. Well, if, it, if it's, it's like, able to look in 3D, the 3D steps I think would be helpful if you yep. see like a ball grid array, for instance. Right. And like um, on the. Now, on a ball grid array, a lot of that you really want to catch during a solder paste inspection which we do 2D solder paste inspection in our stencil printer. Cool. Long term, I want to buy a 3D solder, um, solder paste inspection. That just looks at volume it. as well as... That's right. Okay. Yeah. And the... Um, yeah, nailed it. Um, so, yeah. And then it... You know, the, the unit that we have, we bought a top-of-the-line Omron. Um, it's, it's an AI leverage device. So it's, it's looking... It's... You Matter. don't have to tell it what a bad solder bridge looks like. <laughs> Home skillet knows, and it's That's gonna be like, cool. bro. Does it know from training on like other boards, and it can just tell, or like how the mm -hmm. fuck? Okay, interesting. Oh, it's a mix plus it's plus its home database. Like Omron makes exceptional equipment. So yeah. my understanding is Omron is. I'm a big is, fan of their components. Like, yeah, I've well, not, they, I've not bought PCBA from them. My understanding is so they only do inspection equipment. Um, really, I yeah. thought they made like SSRs and stuff. I um, if they do, um. I'm not aware of it, which is which okay. would be great. I might be thinking wrong. I, 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 I swear to Christ, I put Omron components on like a one-off or a four-off board. Oh, I mean, they, they're they're a big component provider, right? Yeah. Like big component manufacturer. Their inspection equipment was designed to look at their components that they make. Cool. And so, like, there's, yeah, they come with, all this equipment comes with populated databases. How good they are, how much you need to curate, stuff like that. I mean... You get better at that over time. Have you seen the Brother Speedio line of CNC mills? No, I haven't. They're pretty cool. So they make these things in a 30 taper uh, that I know of. And so it's it's like a teeny little, like maybe that big spindle. And um, it it's like the same as like the 40 and 50 taper. And what is it? H, 
I'm gonna get it right. I, HSK one fifty, I think. Hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. I'll probably that last one, but like, it's like this teeny little thing. It can do a tool change in one point three seconds, and so it was developed for brother uh, to work on. I think their printers initially, and hey. then adopted by Apple to work on the iPhone, and so like machining out like iPhones and stuff, and. Um, I've got a buddy uh, who's also been on the podcast, Ariel Eisen, who's got a bike packing and overlanding buckle company in uh, Kingston, Washington, outside Seattle. Yeah. Where he's running one of these in a barn and just making thousands of these. You had me buckles. at overlanding and barn. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> no, he's a cool dude. I like him a lot. He's a great guy to. Actually, on their property, it's really neat. They've got an oyster farm like on the beach, so you can just walk out. Last time I stayed with him, we walked out, we got a bunch of oysters, and then just. You know, brought them back, shucked the really little ones, and then we grilled the bigger ones up. Yeah. Because you can get oysters that are, like, that that big. It's too big. Like, yeah. that. that's a better size for grilling. But, like, it was just, just a blast. Good, 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 good dude. But he's been kind of pushing me to, like, read Shinjio, Shinjio Shingo's books, I think. It's a guy that worked on uh, for Toyota, and his whole thing was, like, single-minute exchange of dye. So being able to do really, really fast tool change to get better utilization out of a machine for single piece flow. Right. So the only way to achieve that is to have fast tool changes. Otherwise you have to bash your parts. And if you fuck up one step, you've now ruined, you know, like the, yeah, that's an exactly entire right. batch of parts. Yeah. And so it, it's really interesting. Um, and the level of automation he's achieved with that little machine, it's maybe a hundred thousand dollar machine, it's a brother's video. Mm -hmm. Is, is just incredible. I mean, like, he, he had a thing where he had, like, he was machining um, part holders out of, I want to say it was, um, he was using PVCA, PVCA, some kind of PVC. I don't know if the A is correct, but some kind of PVC. He machined these things out of PVC, and then you would stick, like, these aluminum blanks for the buckle in them, and then he had, like, a little robotic gripper that sit in one of the 30 table paper tool holders, grabs a little blank, sticks it on the vise, now it switches to an end mill, spins the end mill, does the first machine operation, switches to another end mill in 1.3 seconds, does the next machine operation. Nice. Yeah, and then like, you know, one other, I think it was a five axis machine, and then the little robotic hand comes back in, grabs the thing, sticks it in a finish pile, which is just a Rubbermaid bin that he's fixed to this yeah. machine, <laughs> and then it goes on to the next one. And then he had like an op two thing, which was machined, for the back side of the part. And now you've got four of them in that configuration. You run all those. And so when I last talked to him, he had integrated a flip station, which is since I last saw it. So it's I think it's all shunk equipment. And it, it grabs the thing, flips the 180 degrees with pneumatics, and now it can do it single piece. Mm -hmm. And so he's got these hoppers he's designed where he's 3D printed the hopper, and then it takes uh, hardened steel pins like from McMaster car mm -hmm. that go in a few places in the 3D print that aligns the things and then he's got a pneumatic pusher that pulls them into the machine it's so yeah. cool so so we're doing something similar with our universal robotics arms nice like on electronics manufacturing so one of the things that we found to that point to the tool change problem is the um, not a lot of people that are using your universal robotics arms are really leveraging their tool changing capability and the reason is the boot up time on the new tool. So you grab a new tool, and if it's Modbus, whatever, like like sometimes the tool has a boot up time or a connect time. What kind of times are we talking about? Um, like it could be it could be as much as uh, five or six seconds. Yeah, brutal. Brutal. So well, when you have a capital equipment loan, like you can just turn this into dollars, and then um, if it's Cobotic and not a Shunk or a Scara arm then you can condense the scale that everything's in because they can hit each other and stop. So, so you have multiple arms, so you can stagger the time across? That's right. One? So okay. what we wound up doing is we, we defaulted to a standardized two UR3E arm station. Okay, cool. That share 12 tools. That's and so awesome. one is always booting and changing another tool. Inter okay, so that goes into one of Shingo. Shingo's Same thing concepts which is online tool change versus offline tool change time offline tool so change basically time yeah this is a trade so yeah that yeah yeah that's that's brilliant actually i like that a lot but it's cheap because when you think about it operationally well if you like, do it offline you're not you're not 
cost yourself anything because the other one's still working. You also have the advantage of utilizing it in a two-arm configuration for more complex activities. Wait, seriously? What yeah. are you doing in a two-arm configuration? Like a hold down. Interesting. Like what? It, let, let's say, for example, it's really hard to mate a flex, flex cable. Because it is. Yeah, um, manually it's hard. It is, right? Yeah. So what if you had the ability to use your secondary arm to just be the hold down? Or the hold up, right? So now you also get the advantage. Not only are you getting your tool change time down, but when you need it for what would normally be a human interruptive task that now forces you in a cobotic cell, increases your square footage because a human needs to fit their, you know, butt into the space and, and be able to integrate it and everything else. Um, what if your secondary robot could perform a secondary holding function? That's pretty cool. Yeah, we think it's neat. It's not novel, but it's neat. It seems novel. It's not novel, but it's neat. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So we, we had another company here locally in Western Pennsylvania um, the uh, that we're excited about a joint project with. I can't share yet. I, okay. I think I could share it by the time the pod comes out, but I'm, I'm going to hold nah, it back. don't risk it. Um, but the, um, um, so we're going out to see, see their facility this week, and um, they've expressed interest in... Um, in leasing um, some pre-programmed like two-arm robotic cells, yeah. right? Which is kind of neat. Like it's a it's a business model. It's a RAS model that I hadn't really like explored a whole lot. Interesting. Yeah, and RAS is interesting. RAS like, is interesting. Like, I've seen it done correctly and incorrectly, and I I, I feel like it's it's hard. Boy, there's a bunch there, right? I mean, that's its because own everyone podcast. wants everyone wants the ass and RAS. Everyone wants the ass. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Um, everyone, if you're, if you're, if so, you're the service provider, not if you're the service recipient. Well, so this depends, right? Like, um, there is, there is legitimate value depending on your business model in keeping CapEx, CapEx and OpEx, OpEx. Yep. So what RAS offers you is the ability to keep OPEX, OPEX. Labor's OPEX. Okay. Yep. So let's say you've got so two guys. you look guys. at it as a one-to-one -one replacement rather than having to put out CapEx in order to amortize Fact. over So let, let's okay. pretend that we're taking, let's take a pallet jack, for example. Yep. Okay. So you, um, the person that runs a pallet jack in a warehouse and distribution plant is the, that is the lowest paid person in that facility. Agreed? Always, every time. Always, well, every time. Well, to be fair, though, I've run a pallet jack in some high played jobs, but more to set a good example than because I need to be the guy running the pallet jack. But let's imagine that um, uh, you're running a warehouse. Amazon just dropped a, a big-ass distro facility next to you. You're struggling to hire people now. You're paying more, and the people that don't show up are your lowest paid. You're paying up on your fork truck drivers more than you want to, but now your fork truck drivers are moving pallets and you don't want fork trucks moving pallets. You want them stacking pallets. You want them putting pallets on shelves. So now you're consuming your highest value, your expensive fork truck, your Toyotas, your lift turrets, et cetera, your highly skilled labor, your fork truck operators, and they're just moving fucking material and they don't need to be, right? So, but now your kidders and your pallet jack draggers are the same labor type. They're knuckleheads. Right, great American Harvard <laughs> that are making fifteen dollars an hour, and you fucking people should not be making fifteen dollars an hour. You should be making twenty-five to thirty-two dollars an hour at my facility, mending <laughs> robots, not dragging pallet jack. Anyway, the um, um, so you got these these just above minimum wage types that aren't showing up to work because they're making sixteen at Amazon, okay. Um, love Amazon. I spent fourteen thousand six hundred thirty-two dollars on average per month with you for my business. Thank you. Um, the um, I spend about thirty grand a year to forty grand a year personally. It's just them. bananas, isn't it? <laughs> like I hope you're also a shareholder because it's the only way to make yourself feel better about that. But yeah. they provide a service that's not being fulfilled elsewhere. Anyway, it's because of their warehouse and distribution network. So they pay a dollar more an hour. Whatever you lost all your freaking guys. So you get a bunch of temps show up. You've got one day to teach them what to do a thing, and you've got to pick what they're going to do. Are they going to stuff boxes? Or are they going to move pallets? Probably move pallets. Probably stuffing boxes. Interesting. Why? 
Because you, because there's nothing else on planet Earth that can stuff a box other than a human right now. Well, that's not entirely true. It's not entirely true. You got pick and handle, right? Yeah. You want to make a big investment. You want capex. You want to keep it opex. You're buying people to do that, right? That's so just... now let's think about the RAS model. Yeah. So a RAS model allows you to keep opex opex. So now, I show up at your facility, not me. Somebody from Boston Dynamics or whatever shows up at your facility and says, yo, Spence, I got discovered, man. These deadbeats, like these people that can't pass a piss test, like you don't need to worry about this at 13 to $15 an hour, man. Like I got this covered for you, man. Like I'm gonna put this beautiful robot here and you don't, you know what this robot's worth? And he's gonna tell you. It's gonna be, this robot is half a million dollars. <laughs> and he'll lie to you and whatever else. Yep. And he'll 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 be like, we could paint any color you want and stuff like that. But you only need to pay me twenty five hundred dollars per man shift per month. Interesting. You can use it for two shifts, but then you owe me five grand. You can use it three shifts, but then you owe me seventy five hundred. Yeah, makes sense. Just leave it there. And you immediately find that pick and handle are doing what your people could do at the cost of what your people could do, but they're always here. Yep. And for them, they say, yo, Spence, I don't ever want your business to suffer. I'm just going to park an extra two or three here. <laughs> no, dude, no, bro. You don't need to use it. Okay. It's just sitting here, right? It's just if that breaks, but <laughs> if you need it, you can turn it on and you know what it costs, right? <laughs> so they do that and then they walk away and you're like, I mean, I could hire a guy, but pick here is always at work. <laughs> he works three shifts a day for me. It's all good. OPEX is OPEX, bro. I would have spent that money that way anyway. And you don't even worry about the margin that the Boston Dynamics makes or yeah. the Berkshire Gray or whoever else it is, right? Yeah, yeah. That's RAS. OPEX stays OPEX. So these things are fascinating to me. Things where we can offer businesses that exist right now the ability to stay financially the same way that they exist now in terms of profit and margin, but give them an access into technology that doesn't break the bank. And I think where, where these robot companies go wrong is when they try to turn OPEX into CapEx. And they're like, look, just pay $250,000 and you've got three people's worth of labor. Forever. Forever. I think that's actually a hard sell. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, right? right? I've seen some examples of that. I don't want to name names. <laughs> but but it but it's hard, right? Yeah. And then and then at the same time there's the let, let's talk about the human labor effort of it. Like the um um look our, our nobody wants to take a risk for that. If they no one that. wants yeah. to take a risk for that. Who's gonna put their job on the line for that? Do you think like let's pick Well, there's certain facilities that would take a risk for that. Like I've been in some automotive manufacturing plants recently where they've spent like 400 million dollars renovating so this is this feels this feels different to me that feels very different that feels like an institution that is used to capex is capex well they're big plans yeah okay right like but let's imagine i mean do you do you think today that 50% 50% of the warehouse and distribution in the United States is done by large business? Or do you think it's 75% or do you think it's 30%? Like, let's just let explore me, let me this think about that. I don't know. Warehouse and distribution is mm-hmm. all we're talking about? Yeah, just people that 3PL it, right? People that third-party logistics it. Like, you make a product, you send it somewhere, they box it in something, ship it to, yeah, they're the fulfillment center. Okay, so we're talking about micro fulfillment centers or just all the fulfillment centers? Just generally fulfillment and warehouse centers. Yeah. Okay, so I would guess maybe 30% is small business, 70% is large business, but that's just a guess. I mean, shit, I don't know. Like, um, it's it's fun to it's fun to wonder I'm about. I'm speculating, I don't know. Um, you know, it feels it feels like that might be true, but then let's dive into an individual company. So I had 
And um, where, where do you divide between small and large? Well, exactly. Like that's, yeah. that's an element of it too. So I had a great dinner once with, um, um, with the head of warehouse operations for Boot Barn. I don't know them yet. So Boot Barn, they're just a huge online, they're the Zappos of work boots. Oh, okay. cool. And cowboy boots. They're actually, like I had another person on the podcast. They, they're making work boots for women that are, you'd actually want to be seen in. Like, they're cool. Really? Xena workwear. Yeah, they make, like, fashionable women's work boots. Like, ESD as well? Like, um, so, like, ESD, I don't know if they steel do it. I'll ask them, though. If you text ask me. Ask them if they I'll, do I'll ESD. I'll, yeah. I'll, I know I'll, the co-founders. I'll text you. So, it's, um, yeah, Anna Kraft is the CEO, and then Dimitri Kruachnitzer is the CFO uh, and the COO. So, it's a husband and wife couple. Fascinating. And, but they've been selling. T- they're, they're fucking great. If you look at them. Just for metatarsal to support and like steel caps for you know yeah. avoiding getting your toes crushed, but I can ask about ESD if you if you if you message me about no, it. No, I'll message you about it. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's super cool. So like, yeah. the um, I expect that by headcount in terms of just quantity, there are more small and medium businesses that do warehouse and distribution operations than large businesses, but that when we think about the per capita shipment and things like that. Maybe your maybe your seventy thirty is right. Maybe it's sixty forty. Just Amazon guessing. Marketplace feels like it's still a real place. Like yep. so, you know. But a lot of it's fulfilled by Amazon, which is a large business. Some of it, yeah. yeah. Some of it, much of it. But regardless, like <clears throat> you go to one of those places and you say, "All right, look, the." Um, you know, you need to spend two and a half million dollars to put QR codes on the walls and like repeaters in the ceilings and the um, you know we're gonna we're gonna replace all your uh, can't do it. Yeah, just well, I mean, what it. you just described is probably not two and a half. Million. Well, it depends on the scale of the facility, I think. Yeah, 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 for sure. But once yeah. you start buying robots, that's small. <laughs> so. The yeah, line scanners, you know, Cognex and sick get cut a check, then it goes way up. Yeah, have a secret in here. Talk to some secret yeah. guys. Find <laughs> out what secrets cost in these days, right? Yeah. Like, uh, see, what, see what they want to do. Yeah, exactly. Like the, um, you know, my my suspicion is that if you could come in, and this is something I'd like to explore with, uh, um, one of our friends, um, in Israel Polygon. Like we've got, we've got, um, you know, we're members of the the Arm Institute. And yeah, same. I've got a little white paper that that we're we're uh, toting around a couple of different places about a uh, um, about just a teachable like picking robot. Interesting. And the idea is that it's cheap enough that we could make it and just leave it on the site. And when you want to use it, you just pay more. That's cool. And you just add another one when it hits a certain utilization level, right? Yeah. And like classic RAS model. Keep yeah. OpEx, OpEx, like see what that does. But so you basically, basically become a bank, bank of robots. robots. Well, there's a lot of money in the United States to pay for iron. So what's the right way to put this? Um, the uh, equipment is resellable. So as long as you're buying resellable equipment, borrowing money for resellable equipment is cheap. Okay. So. But it depreciates. Sure. And they want that and it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. So you want to, I think there is a, a real opportunity for businesses who are willing to partner with the lenders of money to buy steel. Yeah. Buy the steel automate the steel, lease it at a higher value to somebody else to perform a value-added function, Yep. RAS style, um, buy OPEX, and then um, we get the money. Sell CapEx. And then you sell CapEx when you need to sell CapEx. You sell it off on a lease, like whatever whatever it is that you, that you want to do. Like, I, yeah. I, I think... I think the buy capex, sell opex, sell capex. I think the trick is you want to keep the money moving the way the money has always moved, and I think people who are trying to be disruptive to the motion of money are unnecessarily swimming against the tide. I think there's way to do RAS models, and 
other equipment models that don't disrupt the way that money moves now and that makes it easier to adopt as you scale down. I think as you scale up, if you're talking about Walmart, you're talking about Target, you're talking about these FedEx or UPS or these big institutions. When you say scale down, you mean sell to small business. Sell to small. Got it. Small business is still the engine that runs the goddamn United States. Like, until that changes, like, why do I want to go and fight for Walmart's attention when Walmart is just going to crush my They're nuts? fucking dicks. Of course they are. They've screwed over so many companies. But of course, but Spencer, of course they, have they are. They a wake of corpses. Of they have all the money. Yep. And they're the whale, right? Yep. Why should I hunt Moby Dick when I can just fish for herring? This doesn't all make sense. All day long. Okay. All day long. Yeah. Like, I, I, I think everybody's just missing. Maybe I'm an idiot, and I know I'm an idiot, so it's probably true. But it just feels like. There, that there is this, that people are missing this glaring, flashing red light that says, attend the small business and the medium and large businesses that our conservative will follow. And if you match their fiscal models, they will match yours. And when you go to a, a Walmart, they're the whale. I mean, yeah, dude, like you freaking sell to Walmart, you sell an infinite number. At no margin because they crushed your nuts and yep. they competed you out. And like, I'm certainly got, guilty of elephant hunting myself. It's, there's, again, going back to an earlier statement, like, I'm an ignoramus who operates on the theory of abundance. There's a ton of work to do out there. Yep. And there aren't enough people to do the work. So let's just focus on the work that people want us to do and pay us for. Makes sense. But in order to do that, you need work that's resaleable. Otherwise, you're getting crushed on an RE. Uh, oh, 100%, right? Like, you can't... I mean, this was the problem that we had at, at Carnegie Robotics, which was we're an engineering services firm that was basically selling work for hire. And if you're doing work for hire, you can't resell that over and over again. So Correct. what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, like, look, we'll do design services at Hellbender as a favor. But what we really want to do is we want to be your manufacturer if you trust us. And if we suck, you can, because we do open source, you could take it somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Um, and if you have a carve out for your specific niche industry, we'll do that work for hire. Right. Of course, um, I'm a businessman. But the, uh, what we want to do is like have people come in, trust us, try to accelerate their product, make it. If we don't make it, we can't make it cheap enough. Bro, take it to China. I'm sorry. I failed. I did my best to bring it to the U.S. Like, we tried real damn hard. Um, sorry for your luck. I think we'll keep it. And I think we'll be able to find suppliers locally that, that can do it at a price that's sustainable for everybody. Pretty cool. And hits everybody's ESG goals, right? Like, uh, ESG? Like, um, environmental sustainability and governance, right? Got it. Like, okay. Basically, the... It's the UN and, and, and B Labs way of um, measuring and being good rather than just saying you're good, right? Like, how do you it, quantify that? Oh, there's lots of ways to quantify <laughs> that. I mean, so let's say you go to um, Shell Oil's ESG page. Yep. They're going to show you a beautiful picture of Clean Beach that doesn't have any oil that touches it, right? And, and you know, Don will show you a duck that's been cleaned off from BP as oil. It's amazing, right? <laughs> it's so beautiful and stuff like that. Um, so then let's 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 wind that back. So you go to you go to my ESG page when I relaunch my website, hopefully by the time this pod launches. Um, and hellbender.com. Yeah, hellbender.com. And the uh, and hopefully you you read our um, energy analysis and our carbon offset purchase as a result of that and um, um, et cetera. So like you know, we're, we're doing things like, um, um, you know, metal, metal and water is just crushes an ecosystem. Okay. So how do you mean just metal and water? So like if you go parts per million of aluminum or, you know, um, um, iron or whatever, yeah. like, um, um, very detrimental to an ecosystem. Well, one of the ways that that gets in the water, if you're in China, um, or in places that aren't aggressively regulating the environmental aspects of your industry, 
um, when you do solder paste and you just wash off your stencil, <laughs> it winds up in your effing watershed. Okay? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, so we do closed circuit recycling for all of our solder paste. That's pretty cool. So our solder paste all goes into buckets. We sell them because they have value, right? Yep. Like, I mean. But it's also impure, so you can't reuse it correct. yourself. Yeah. That's right. We're not recycling it that way. We're recycling it through an industrial recycler. Yep. Um, they buy it from us. Like, we get paid after the fact by pound of what they recover from it. Smart, um, actually. I, I've run those numbers for some companies. It's quite good, You actually. can recover a lot of margin that way. I was, I was delightfully surprised. Yeah. Um, so not only are we more than compliant with Clean Water Act because our stuff never touches water, right? Like, <laughs> but we're also getting paid back like for things that would have otherwise been waste to us. That's awesome. So the, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, the, um, I imagine that the best practicers in China are doing the same thing, but I, I have a hard time imagining that it's the average, right? Yeah. But like, I don't know, this has always given me heartburn. Why wouldn't you do that? You can recover money. You can narrow your margins. You can earn more. Like, but you, there, but that's worth but, money to someone. But it's worth money to someone. But there needs to be penalties for being sloppy or wasteful. Yeah. And if you don't have those penalties, wouldn't the penalty intrinsically be? Yeah, lost revenue. Correct. Right? You would think that it's lost revenue. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not if the industry hasn't been stood up there. And doesn't exist. Yeah, it makes sense. So if there's no one to buy it, then you're... Or or if you're willing to kind of toe the line on how A long lot of people do that. Paste. I, I've been in facilities where... I'm not talking about solder paste in particular, but I'm talking about like different byproducts of manufacturing. I don't want to say because I want people to ID who I'm talking about here. But like scrap material, mm -hmm. you know, just being thrown in the garbage as opposed to recycled... At the expense of like a fucking good margin, you know. Oh no! I mean, look, look, we're, um, you know, hell, we've got Alcoa down the road, right? Yep. Like, um, um, we have. Yeah, if you were to throw your aluminum in the trash rather than recycling it, we have you're probably so losing just, about yeah. three and a half to four percent margin. Gosh, I, I'll bet it's, I'll bet it's more than that. Yeah, um, it so, depends on the market. So. Right. It can be 7.2 in a good market, right. three and a half in a bad market. Right. I'll bet we're somewhere in between. But I mean, if I had to guess, you know, like those are the numbers I would guess. I, yeah. I, you know, so we, um, so, you know, we, we try to be as green as possible. Um, and when we evaluate that as part of the design. So one of the things that we approached Raspberry Pi about was changing their um, camera mount on their high quality camera. So we wanted to use their high quality camera on this one product. We bought 65,000 of them. Um, and the, um, and then we asked them to put the SEM 12 mount on it instead of their base CS mount. This was why we had to sell them the IP. So they were like, eh, for the same price, we'll just sell it to you. You can peel it off, throw it away. And like, that hurts my soul. Yeah. Like you want me to just waste all this good product? Like this is like good aluminum. What's well, a gotta connector? Spend, Someone had to make that as value add? Yeah, I've got to spend effort taking it off. Some it fuck on. had to actually put it together. I mean, right. Yeah. Like, so, so we negotiated with them and, and they were great. Like, like Pi is so, so good to work with. Um, you know, they, uh, they were like, well, okay, but only if we own the design. So we sold them the design and they, uh, and they did the M12 mount design. So for the first couple hundred, we had to remove like this, this aluminum lens mount. Um, and then within our shop, we, decomposed it so we took the zinc fasteners out threw them in a separate pile yeah zinc bin yep zinc bin kept the aluminum in the aluminum bin yep. pulled the uh, plastic uh you know blanks out the just the imager shrouds put them in a plastic bin i've done um, quite a bit of research on this if you ever want to talk like just material recycling through various means mm. you know me i've a horrible problem with always wanting to talk yep. so we'll uh we'll just um we'll put a pin in that yep we'll save that give me a call that's perfect yeah <laughs> so it's all good yeah yeah no that's just all all super super exciting so the um but i mean that in general that just kind of lends itself to you know like what does esg mean in general for like a, an entity in robotics, an entity in Pittsburgh, an entity in the U.S. Yeah. Um, 
and it's trying to attack. So it's those three elements, right? It's the environmental, it's the social, and then it's the governance. So if we break those down, so we, most of what we were just talking about was in the environmental. It even breaks down to why would you renovate a an existing facility rather than building a brand new Leeds Platinum facility? Well, the Leeds Platinum facility didn't exist before, right? So inherently, it's going to be a higher environmental impact, like than renovating a facility if you can do it at the same cost. You know, because that, that's a facility that already exists. Um, touchy subject, especially here. But <laughs> the um, um, then when you get into the social, the social is asking questions about, like, are you doing the right thing for your community stakeholders? Um, Who are your community stakeholders, example-wise? Uh, so example-wise for us, um, so so Hellbender, so we're in uh, Harmer Township. Um, we're part of the University of Pittsburgh, like... Uh, um, applied Research Center, so we're part of the University of Pittsburgh family, like to that extent. So we, we think of ourselves as a part of the uh, um, the uh, not only like the, the greater Pittsburgh region, um, but also the local community, you know, there in uh, in Harmer. Um, and so you you think about things like um, what's the cost of renovating the space versus adding another space on site. Um, when you talk to community stakeholders, um, we have a social component. We're a benefit corporation in yep. Pennsylvania. First um, one for tech. First, first one for tech and manufacturing um, at the same time. Probably the first one for tech. It's a little blurry, but I'm going to claim what's it. What's the other one? I'm just going to claim it until somebody corrects me. Um, uh, you heard it here first. Uh, yeah, um, heard it here <laughs> first. So the um, so. Um, the uh, when when you become a benefit corporation in in Pennsylvania, that protects you from having to make profit, put profit before mission. Yeah. Um, so what we did was we said our mission was to uh, do product design and manufacturing of dual use technologies, like in Western Pennsylvania, and dual provide, use. Dual use. So dual use means uh, government plus commercial. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and because um, uh, unlike most people, I love the government. Like I think the government's are just supposedly the stewards of our best interests. So I love that. Love that part. You don't like it? Talk to your yeah. elected officials. Talk to your elected <laughs> yeah. officials, people. Um, <laughs> then we have some specific benefits. We have four of them. The first one is to provide socioeconomic benefit better than just creating jobs to our employees to our, um, uh, to veterans, um, to tech startups, and to be environmentally conscious. In that order. In that order. Interesting. So what that allows us to do is that allows us to take losses to, to help tech startups get a product out. Yep. Um, it allows us to provide charitable donations to veterans and veteran yeah. causes allows us to do um what both. veteran causes do you like around here I've... oh my two favorite yeah. th this is this is a topic i'm super passionate about my two favorite are the um uh veterans place on washington's boulevard interest i don't know about this yet okay so let's talk about them then we'll talk about the next one okay so so every quarter our plan is every quarter we donate to Veterans Place on Washington's Boulevard and to the Keystone chapter of the Paralyzed Veterans of America. Oh, cool. I've heard good things. Um, yeah. So, so the, um, uh, so Veterans Place is um, kind of like a half and three quarters way house for um, uh, homeless veterans. The, uh, they have a specific charter to help um, my generation of veterans, so Gulf War and later um, veterans who were homeless um, and are struggling, particularly with uh, either addiction problems or uh, psychological issues, which is just rampant in yeah. uh, my generation of uh, veteran. And I think the guy I want to introduce you by, to, by the way, is a Gulf War vet. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So the um, so what. What Veterans Place is doing is like uh, they'll reach out, they'll find these homeless veterans, they'll give them a home, they'll provide some job training 
and job searching. They'll give them a safe place to uh, to live while they get on their feet and then transition them out. Cool. Long term, I hope that we can start to hire out of Veterans Place. Nice. Right. Um, but we're not there yet. We're not we're not mature enough to, to handle that. Um, well, it seems like a risk to hire out of a charity. I, unfortunately, I hate to say this. It sounds really bad. No, I mean, hey, we, we got to like, have the real conversations or nobody's going to have the real conversations. Correct. And so there's there's organizations I've tried to hire from before where they're trying to place, like, people from, like, you know, urban areas that are just not doing great, you know. And you want to you wanna help because it's it's shitty that, like, people are hurting. But at the same time, you know... I always want to hire on skill before anything else. And then next, well, skill, reliability, and hardworking. I mean, those are the three things. Yeah. And um, and reliability and hardworking are kind of the same thing. But other than Mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's skill and, you know, you're going to show up and do your job. Yeah, I mean, I I think at the end of the day, when when you're thinking about this, uh, you're not wrong. Like, the, um, um, this is, this is just a reliable labor problem. Um, And, when you know when i look at a place like um uh veterans place on washington boulevard like they have placement programs like the if the, if there's a way that we can grow into the size of institution that we need to be to be able to handle um a fluctuation of available that labor, makes sense okay then it makes sense yep. i think if you're like under 20 people this is a very difficult thing correct like, Spencer, we can't handle it, right? Because if somebody doesn't show up to a job, we're not in You're fucked. Yeah. Right? Like the, um, but once you hit, there has to be a statistically significant number that we can hit for team members that allow us to incorporate take, and take the yeah. chance. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And incorporate it as well, a part of the way that we need we'll redundancy to a certain extent. And then you can handle. Yes. fluctuations and, and a little bit of non-reliability. So, so the, the most impressive, um, so we aspire to be a B Corps as well. Um, what's a B Corps? So B Corps is, um, there's this, there's this, um, uh, nonprofit called B labs that if, if your listeners don't know about them, you, you gotta go I to the website and yeah. check them out. They're, they're super cool. So uh, founded by a couple guys that, I think the way the story goes, they had this badass apparel company making like freaking really, really cool um, uh, footwear for basketball. And interesting. Just like at some point, they started to do these tours of their supply chain and saw that their supply chain in Bangladesh and, and places of similar ilk were just not providing the kinds of benefits and lifestyle that they would hope that their the workers that they would, would support get to enjoy yeah. would get to enjoy yeah and so they totally changed how they were handling their supply chain things like that um and then they got bought and they were very profitable but then they got bought and when they got bought things just turned back into the way it was before and they got pissed and so they quit because this is what this did, was executive didn't, leadership didn't we talk yeah didn't we talk about this last time with like um we might have yeah, what like um, Richard Branson and the I only ever created something out of frustration. <laughs> like, dude, my best work has been out of spite in my life. Like, yeah, if I if I want let's to show someone pivot. up, that's when I really let's pivot that into frustration. Really and shit. you're in the Richard Branson model, right? Yeah. Like the uh, so let so let's imagine that you've got this apparel company, you sell it. And all this shit that you had done to fix your supply chain and make it fair and equitable and reasonable, like gets undone in the, in the name of profit. Yeah. In, 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 the name of, in the name of old British corporate law, which was, what's a corporation? A corporation is a group of freaking people who throw money together to make money to do a thing. And so that's why you can have activist investors. That's why Carl Icahn exists. What's Carl Icahn? Oh, um, Carl Icahn um, is a famous activist investor. Like, Who's Carl Icahn? That's what he, I meant to say. Yeah, so so he's this um, brilliant investor. Um, the uh, that I don't want anywhere near my stuff. That is <laughs> that that'll buy a tiny stake in a company and then sue by corporate law and say Fuck. you're not making enough money for me. What a cunt! 
well, this is the way the law works. So, I mean, if you're a corporation and you're incorporated by British law, you can buy like a like two shares and just sue. Well, I mean, you have to buy a reasonable amount. So, okay. like, I think he famously got Apple to pay a huge dividend. Okay, huge dividend. I think his hedge company bought like two percent. Holy shit! Maybe two to four percent of Apple, which That's is not, not a small amount. Out of a hundred, I mean, it is that way. But like, I mean, that's a lot of money. That sounds like you're on Carl's side, I, I which is fine, right? I don't know I mean, their market cap. <laughs> well, no, no, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, I just said it's, just expen easier. it's expensive to operate in that way. Yes, you have to have a decent amount of capital. Yes, uh, capex, not yes. capex. No, you have the market to have, cap has to be high in order to be able to market, do that. You gotta you, have some cash. You have to have a lot of money. Yeah. To buy in. But you're also a cunt. Which is fine. <laughs> yeah. This like like look, you don't like the rules, you change the rules. Yeah. So these guys at B Labs um, created this foundation to try to invent benefit corporations, which could have a mission before profit but still make money. Which negates the ability to do that. Right. So yeah. they're, they're the reason why benefit corporations exist in Pennsylvania. Because they lobbied to create this and make this happen. And one day I hope to meet their standard as a B Corp, like which is their own certification. Um, and I think we're going to score well, but you've got to have like a year of observation and all that stuff. And we, we're just starting the process. Okay. Um, but the... Um, um, so I'm sure we're going to be, be a corp and a benefit corporation. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, but really, we're their type of invention. So I just bring that up because there's this company called um, Grayston Bakery. That Grayston Bakery. Grayston Bakery. They're in uh, they're in New York. Uh, they're in New York City. Um, they make the brownies for like Ben and Jerry's. Interesting. Um, like like fudge brownie ice cream. I'm like, picturing Brooklyn. Are they in Brooklyn? I'm just imagining. I imagine what they're in the Bronx, but maybe the Bronx is cheaper because they're cheap. I don't know. Like the, uh, gosh, I don't want to like lose an invite to Grayson Bakery <laughs> because I don't know where you're located. <laughs> but their shit is great. So they they yeah. do this thing called open hiring. They're so so baking's a hard freaking job, right? Yeah. Like you ever bake? I never baked. I'm more of a Grill top, yeah. Saute, motherfucker. Same. Myself. As as we as I we explored in our last conversation, yeah. we're more interested in cutaways of equipment yeah. and grilling than you Modern and I are. Cuisine. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> then 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 you and I are in like working our asses off, like baking shit, measuring, baking, uh, measuring, weighing oh, fucking flour and such sugar. Hard work. And Is that chemistry? Isn't that just chemistry? In a way. Like, um, in any well, case. Well, molecular gastronomy, I think, is really the... It really is. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, yeah, xanthan gum. Have you had Zeke... Sodium uh, citrate Have you nonsense. had uh, Jake Paniculum on here yet? Not yet. I, I know the guy. I've cooked with him at his place. Yeah, you've got... You just got to have him on here. Ben's his buddy. Yeah, Ben's buddy. Yeah, yeah Ben and okay. Isaac. Yeah. Yeah, well, Ben um, Isaac's Ben great. Isaac and Ethan. Yeah. He's, he's, he's been trying to talk me to get my pilot's license. Oh, Ben, of course. Yeah. 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 Ben, ben got... Ben got his fingers into one of my new hires, Caleb. Um, but that's for another podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. Israeli guy with a name like Caleb? Um, Caleb, no, from South Dakota. Interesting. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, hired him in, uh, um, yeah, like Lifetime. Um, yeah, so actually South Dakota's got a really good tech school out in uh, Rapid City, Rap Rapid City School of Mines. Nice. They make I've, heard, some I've heard about them. I've hired for I, when I had a um, uh, an office for ARA out in Wyoming. I hired out of there. That's awesome. And uh, they're excellent. Um, the um, just like I recommend Colorado State, and the um, uh, yeah. So he was he was in in South Dakota, like working. Had lived in Denver and I hated it. And we talked him into joining us at Hellbender. Nice. So, He's in Pittsburgh now. Him. Yeah, now he's in Pittsburgh. Good place. Um, and um, on the promise that he could move back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Um, Are you going to cover his re relocation? If he I will. Some? Yeah, he's a rock star. Of... He's a rock star. Yeah. Like, he's he's freaking phenomenal. Like, yeah. one, easily, easily one of the best firmware developers I've ever worked with. Those are hard to get. Holy shit. Full stop. Yep. 
Yep. Yeah. So there's not that many people that can do that. And that want to do it. Correct. Well, I don't know why, though, because when I was getting my CS degree, I loved the low-level stuff more than anything else. And everybody wants to do high-level. Like, I, I don't understand why nobody's got any love for, like, talking to the hardware. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I really honestly don't know. But before we before we lose track of the, uh, the Grayson stuff, so Grayson Bakery is a, they're an open hiring company. Anybody Wait, that really? show anybody that shows up at their door and says they want a job, they'll pay for that day of work. Interesting. This is deeply fascinating to me. It's not something that is amenable to technology work. Yeah, I'm not sure it is either. But and I don't know how to incorporate those kinds of concepts into in our company. But maybe you need like a trial period where you do training, but then training would have to be inexpensive because training can get. I mean, expensive. you could probably you could probably start in like shipping and receiving or something like that. But yeah, the uh, but that. it's just it's just I love the idea that there's a safe haven place where you can go earn just a day get labor. a shot. Yeah, yeah, just get a shot, earn a day of labor, yeah. like see see if it see if you could pull it off. It's yeah, it super, sense. super, there's a lot of places like that, that I think are deep on. They probably get access to folks nobody else gets because of that. Oh, you, 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 you would have to. Yeah. Um, the, um, yeah, there's a really interesting, do you read a lot of, um, have you read a lot of Jack London's nonfiction stuff? Uh, yeah. So like, like Jack London wrote this. Now we're totally off the freaking rails. Um, I mean, we're supposed to be. We're, sp we're supposed to be. The, uh, yeah. So um, I think it's called The Abyss or Into the Abyss. There's this, there's this discussion. Um, it's almost like investigative journalism that Jack London did in London in the 1800s where he just moved from poorhouse to poorhouse. Interesting. Was this like a dude that didn't have to be in the poorhouse but just did it for the sake of learning? It's fucking Jack London. I don't know who that is. Well, a dude wrote Call of the Wild, okay. uh, like uh, sea, The Sea Wolf, um, okay. the, um, um, you know, great writer. I've heard of Call of the Wild. Slash investigatory yeah. journalist. Yeah. I and, think I've heard that about like mental institutions. Somebody that checked themselves in on schizophrenia and like was not able to get out. <laughs> they were like stuck. Yeah. Be careful. It, yeah. They got Care, they, careful what you want to look into. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, there's so it, it feels it feels like anyway, I just bring that up to say that like there there are histories in in Western civilization, probably Eastern civilization as well, of these institutions that provide uh, room and board um, or pay for itinerant work. Um, itinerant? Uh, uh, temporary, transitory. Um, Got it. Passing. Um, tomato land type work, right? Yeah, I've heard about like, well, I met a guy in South Oakland who, like, was, like, cleaning the fucking stadium here in Pittsburgh, like, with a temp crew, and with just pocket shit that he found that people left behind. Right. Yeah. So, so if you imagine that, I think the idea is trying to provide people that are living on the margins with ways to live in, out of the margins. Like, how do you transition from... I live in the margins. I live illegally. I, I don't have papers. I don't have enough pay. Yeah. Like whatever. How do you move that into normal? I can imagine it's not easy. No, and well, I, mean, I interviewed another guy in here that had to immigrate illegally into the states. He was at NASA for twenty years, but his family smuggled him in, like through like fucking, um, like from El Salvador. Like they went through Mexico, and then they came in through these coyotes, and they had to like his mom's fucking shirt ripped on like a barbed wire fence on the way in. Like, yeah. I mean, you, you think about this stuff and you, but he's like, he worked now separate to it. He's a Google now. What? He's the, brilliant. This he's is the smartest guys I know. This is, this is wrong. Right. Yeah. Like at the, uh, at the end of the day, um, one of the ways that our nation became, what's more great. patriotic than that? Like coming to the U S you know, from fuck. Yeah. I mean, like, 
Yeah. I'm I'm the least diverse person you're gonna talk to in your podcast, right? Like <laughs> the uh, like it. my entire DNA yeah. comes from the British Isles. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of like when, and like how <laughs> how long ago. There's like it's except funny. for my splash of Alsatian German, yeah, that's fine. Like uh, you know, hi, my friends and my my cousins in France. Um, but the um, you know otherwise like it's 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 fairly monolithic. But there were times when you know, you have, you, you take a look at the United States and you say, like, all right, when did we, when did we profit from immigration? Short answer, we always profited from immigration. <laughs> like, to, I mean, it would be fucking ignorant to sit here and say, there was a time when immigration was bad. Yeah. Spencer, can you remember a time in American history when immigration was a bad thing? I'm sure there's been one or two dicks that immigrated that are bad in some way. But, like, that's always going to happen. It's always going to happen, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, Statistically, no. Yeah. He'll never show up here. But my best friend on planet Earth, who I'm sorry I haven't talked to you in weeks, buddy. Um is uh josh howard we were in the marines together cool um the uh uh we were in iraq together um so the uh in the same track all the way all the way through iraq so um uh josh is badass so J josh is a uh josh josh is a federal agent um we should try These to get guys josh are interesting if if josh ever comes to visit me we're gonna try to add an evening yep so that he can just come on here Amen. um It'd be challenging. Like I book out like about two weeks or three weeks in advance. Oh, uh, we'll try to figure it out. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like I'm he's in. got he's got family in Chillicothe, Ohio, yeah. so we're not like totally out of his his range. But the um, it would be it would be great to just have him talk a little bit about um, the Somali community in Columbus, Ohio. There's a Somali community in Columbus. There's a. The largest Somali community outside of Somalia is fuck in me, are you serious? Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. How the fuck? How do I... Dude, Did there I is so that? much shit that just we don't know about us. Okay. Yeah. And there's so much good that comes out of immigration and Mexican yeah, culture. Of and there's challenges too. Yeah. Right. But like. I mean, fuck. All of our family has immigrated here. You're talking about the British. We're all fucking That's immigration. We're all immigrants. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the ones that aren't. Unless you're like a fucking Native American, you're probably an immigrant. Like. Which, yeah, I mean, some some of my friends in the uh, in the Shoshone Nation in the Wind River Indian Reservation, like yeah. out in Wyoming, like yeah, they're they're legit, and I shouldn't have a cabin out there. I'm sorry, like that's your land, um, but it's a great spot. <laughs> and the um, um, yeah, like no, exa exactly to your point. Um, the uh, we're all we're a nation of immigrants. I don't think we celebrate that enough. I, I think we yeah. I think we forget about that. Yep. It's certainly true. I mean, like, my great-grandparents came over from Latvia and were street peddlers uh, in Latvia. They opened up, like, you know the tea station downtown? Yeah. That's That was Max Azen's furs. That's my great-grandfather. He opened a fur coat shop there. Really? Yeah. And then Sam Krauss, my other great-grandfather, like, was also selling women's clothing with a different store. And they just kind of worked their way up and, like, built wealth through the generations and that's fantastic yeah and then you know their kids you know did like a little bit more and were doctors and like their kids were also doctors and then, but, but you, you see this in um tons and tons of our surnames here in pittsburgh right yeah like talk about the sinceris like super recognizable because of the strip district yeah. and like the the foods and the lawyers and the yeah like it's um that's the way it's supposed to be we're yeah. supposed to be able to come in here and build ourselves up that's the american dream right yeah have you seen colin quinn's uh unconstitutional no it's pretty good he, it's it's a little bit it's a little hokey but he talks about like you know if you go to america your kids are gonna your kids are gonna live inside <laughs> like some guy comes back to the old country. Shit, that guy, guy's the richest guy in our shitty little village. He was in America. Fuck, I should send my son there. He's kind of a schmuck, you know. Like, see what he can do. <laughs> As opposed to like the old way, where like you know, it's like, you know, 
I want to be a doctor. What's your name? I'm, I'm Dan Shoemaker. Fuck you. You make Fuck. my shoes. That's right. You, know? you make my shoes. But like, why would yeah. you do that? <laughs> do anything else. Yeah, exactly. No. I mean, I, I'd like to I'd like to see us, like, um, get our kids back into our companies again, like, a little bit more. Like I, I thought th- it's a mixed bag, right? I mean, like, it's good if the kids want to do it. I mean, it's could be loyalty depending on the dynamic. Oh, then, 100%, right? Like, yeah. I, I just mean exposure to like like regular work like the uh so you know my my old man is an entrepreneur yep um left the corporate life i worked for my dad before i was legally allowed to work well this is how it's supposed to be yeah right like the um i mentioned that cornell job before that i was fucking stuffing envelopes my dad's orthopedic surgery practice of course you were this is the right thing to do (laughs) like like fucking eight years old or whatever (laughs) no this is what you're this is what you're supposed to do this is where work ethic comes from like this is this is how america is built like the um um past due notices to fucking patients that hadn't paid their collections motherfucker like you know i'll break your fucking knees (laughs) right which i just gave you yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. No, that's yeah. why he did specialize in knee replacements. Oh, so conflicted. <laughs> yeah. So complicated there. The, um, yeah. The, no, like, um, you know, my old man left, uh, left corporate life, um, bought a glass business. Um, I worked there, like, you know, before I was old enough to and everything else. It was great. And, uh, um, and then it went bankrupt, which was also great to learn from, but not great at the time. Um, but the uh, but that's how you learn, right? That's how you get the hunger for, you know, running the show, knowing what's possible. Yep. Knowing how to hire. Knowing you also want to outdo that there. guy. Like that's Fuck. unfortunately. Yeah, and that <laughs> you want to live wrong? in that shadow. Yeah, mm. it's an interesting feeling. Mm, yeah. Dad stuff. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Yeah, man. Love you, Dad. Love you, Dad. <laughs> can Can I ask about the the bank story? The bank robbery. Yep. <laughs> oh. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So this. So this is uh, this is another throwback. This is uh, this is an Iraq War invasion throwback. Um. So the uh, we were in the town of. I believe it was Al Rifa. Um, we were trying to find a way to pay the, um, we were being threatened by the police and the people, the hospital, the school teachers, et cetera, that they wouldn't work without pay. Interesting. And so, um, they were still willing, this is 2003, this is invasion in Iraq. I don't know what month, probably like May, June. Um, June probably, maybe July. The uh, they were they wanted to get paid, so we needed Iraqi dinar. Yeah. Why? Didn't cost us anything to get Iraqi dinar. <laughs> and as far as we were concerned, anything that the government owned from Iraq, we just now owned yep. as America because winning. Um, <laughs> and so the uh, the simple math of it was, we thought we should just go to the bank and make a withdrawal of whatever the government owned, and we should just pay these people in Iraq and dinar. Wouldn't that devalue the dinar? Look, we're not economists. We're fucking jarheads. Fair man. enough. Like, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're a bunch of Marines. We had a bunch of people that were just like, how are you going to pay us? And we're like, um, we're going to aim rifles at you, and we're going to say work. And if you don't, kaboom. And they're <laughs> like, how about dinar? And we're like, or they're like, how about American dollars? And we're like, F you. And they're like, how about dinar? And we're like, you know, that's probably fine. Um, that's how I imagine it happened in our head. I don't speak Arabic. Um, so the, uh, a- anyway, um, I'm a happy-go-lucky, you know, infantry assaultman sergeant. And I'm, I'm sitting on a whole pile of plastic explosives. And my first arm comes over to me. First arm Parker. I love you, first arm Parker. <laughs> so for Star Parker comes over to me, uh, Force Recon Bubba, badass and mofo, and and he's like, um, uh, "Hey, I might need you to blow something up that's like big and expensive and metal." I was like, "Oh, what's that for, Sarn?" And he was like, "I don't know, maybe like a bank vault." And I was like, "I've dreamt about this moment." And so the um, um, so I got all of my stuff together, 
So I, I don't know if it's true, but I definitely took a scientific calculator to Iraq. I don't know if I was the only infantryman to have a scientific calculator in Iraq. Scientific or graphing? Oh, definitely a graphing calculator. Nice. So, yeah. So, no, I had a, um, so it was a T-85. Nice. That's better than what I had in those days. Um, oh, so, like, custom gasket, stayed in a Ziploc bag, like, ready to rock and roll. Nice. Had Tetris on it. Um, Tetris is sweet. The, um, yeah, legit. Um, legit graphing calculator. And the, um, a great tape measure. Metric and English. Because Wait, tape measure? Tape measure. How? Like, tape measure. What, you me- you use the calculator as a unit? No, 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 no. Like, plus a tape measure. Like, got not, it, got like, it, in got addition it, got to, it, got like, it. a tape measure. I thought um, you were using the calculator as, like, a full... Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. No, <laughs> that would have been, that would have been atrocious. Um, yeah. The, um, yeah, that would have slowed things down. And Absolutely, it would have. So, um, so then off we go. So I've got a couple, couple, uh, couple bags of C4s, a couple satchel charges, um, a bunch of data sheet, data sheets, this like super fast burning, um, really good for shape charges. Comes in these, um, um, comes in like these, these four millimeter thick, like sheets of plastic explosive. You cut shapes out of them. And then like, it come, if they're adhesive. Back How are you meant to cut it? Like just like a scalpel? Just cut them, cut them, cut them with a razor blade. Okay. Yeah. Cut them with a razor blade, like lay them on top of each other. We used, um, um, I used um, uh, EMT scissors a lot. Yep. For demolitions, those are nice. They're great, right? Because yeah. um, I use c- medical tools a lot in my work. I yeah. use forceps a lot and like harnessing. Yeah, you, you yeah. never need to sharpen the shit. Like mm-hmm. it's 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 fantastic. Anyway, so we um, so we go to this bank, um, and uh, bank managers there. We've got uh, an Iraqi translator separate story we found him on the side of a road nice um and um the uh so the first sergeant's like give us the keys show us the accounts we we want the federal money and only the federal money we don't want to take any money that belongs to like any citizen of of the town he's like oh i have no idea where the other key is in arabic like blah 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 and um the uh you know translators going back and forth the first sergeant's like all right, Sergeant B, measured up. And I'm like, man. <laughs> I'm looking at this bank vault door, and all I'm thinking of is, like, this is going to be some three kings, dead presidents, like, but I'm going to do it pro, like, beauteous. Like, <laughs> no mistakes, perfect calculations. So I'm measuring where the pins are. I'm marking it with my Sharpie. How can you tell where the pins are, just like you're say? Oh, so the uh, actually uh, on their design, it was it was it was fairly simple. You could see on the on the edges of the door, like um, the uh, um, the dents okay. of them having the pins open and shutting the door. Interesting. So you and, knew exactly where. They so were. you could see these tiny little lines, yeah. like right at the edge, and so I just assumed that that was where. Some doofus had tried to shut the door with the pins out. Got it. Okay. And, you know, um, I mean, we didn't have the internet or anything, so I couldn't, like, Google anything. But, but it's, a, it's a sound inference. It's a, yeah. So, the yeah. Uh, anyway, so planning for that, cutting everything out, measuring it. And I'm just having, like, the best fucking day of my life. I'm, I'm just like, I am so happy. <laughs> you know, first hour <laughs> comes over at some point, and bank manager's getting really nervous, like, agitated. And like, like we had talked about before, um, Iraq was a former British protectorate. Yeah. Like in, until like the uh, 1960s. And so a lot of the older, wealthier people in Iraq spoke English yep. um, as a secondary language and things like that. And there was no reason to expect that, that a, this bank manager didn't. It was a small town. Um, but in any case, like the, um, um, so I measured this thing out and I'm getting ready to cut charges. And I'm starting to shape them yep. and getting ready to go. And the first sergeant comes over and he asked me, like, all right, Sergeant B, so uh, you can be able to get this vault open without doing any doing any damage to what's inside? I take a look around. I was like, A number one, 100% first sergeant, not a problem. It might take me two or three tries. This vault's coming open. I won't damage anything inside. <laughs> and he starts to turn away. And I was like, but I can't say the same for the building that surrounds it. He's like, I'm sorry, come again? I'm like, well, this building's built cheap. This motherfucker might fall down around this. We might have to dig it out two or three times. But I'm getting this vault open. 
I'm not burning any money on here like some freaking amateur. Well, that bank manager had to have spoken English because on the threat of his bank building falling down around him, he <laughs> just magically remembers where the second key is. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> how much money the, the former Iraqi federal government had and everything else. And, um, and that's how I was robbed of my ability to rob a bank. But I was, <laughs> um, I was close, man. I was close. I was close. That's fucking hilarious. It was. Uh, it's going to be a great day. Instead, it was. It was not a great day. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you got what you needed to fulfill the mission, at least. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't get to blow up a bank vault. You know, every once in a while, you just wish that life aspirations would come after mission, but they 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 tend not to. Brutal. Mm-hmm. Should we end on that note? Or? Yeah, why don't, why don't we end on that note? This was fun. Yeah, this like, was a lot uh, of fun. Anything you want to plug while you're here? No, I think I've plugged enough, right? All right, like, fucking sweet. I've plugged enough.